One letter. Inside a manor, a young and handsome man was reading a book while sitting on a chair next to a fireplace. This young man looked to be in his twenties and had a very handsome face. He was tall about 180 cm with black hair and blue eyes. He had an angular face. To be precise, he had a face that solicited trust in others. However, this young man's eyes betrayed the kindness that his face displayed. Deep in his eyes were a terrifying calmness, a calmness that bordered on indifference to anything and everything even human lives. While the young man was reading, he suddenly raised his head and looked through the window. There, he saw an owl a few meters away rushing in his direction. He waved his hand, then the window opened. A few seconds later, the owl entered the cozy room with a letter in his mouth. The young man snapped his finger, then a few pieces of bread appeared on a table at arm's reach from him. While the owl gorged itself, the young man opened the letter. Dear Mr. Edward Bones, we are pleased to inform you that you have passed the first review to become a professor at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. However, a final interview with the headmaster is required before a final decision can be made. This interview will take place three days later on July 7, 1991. Please send a reply indicating your attendance on said date. Yours sincerely, Professor Minerva McGonagall, Deputy Headmistress. Edward sighed after seeing this letter. It has been more than 17 years since he transmigrated into this world. At that time he was only six years old. After going through the shock and grieving process of his death and reincarnation, he was quick to discover that he was in Harry Potter's world. Luckily for him, the moment he transmigrated was also the moment his magical power rioted. However, he soon learned that he was born more than 17 years before the start of the story. Edward was very happy with this fact as this meant that he had plenty of time to grow stronger. Of course, that was if he could survive the first wizarding war while being a six-year-old toddler. After taking a brief stride towards memory lane, Edward took out a quill to reply. Once the owl was finished eating, Edward placed the letter in his mouth and watched him fly away. Three days later, Edward put on a muggle suit that he had personally tailored for him with a cloak on. Then, he instantly operated from his home and appeared at Diagon Alley. While walking in the crowded alley, Edward watched many crowds going in and out of many stores. His eyes stood for a brief moment of two particular children. They each had a strange object attached to their wrists. Then, these two children would place a card on the object in their hand, following which, different kinds of monsters would appear after they each took their turns playing the cards. What these children were playing was actually Yu-Gi-Oh! dueling cards invented by Edward himself. The game has become widely popular in the wizarding world among both children and adults. Official competitions have already been conducted, and even an international one was held two years ago. After only taking a brief look at these children, Edward headed to one of his stores. However, before he could enter, he encountered a woman that was exiting the store. The woman looked at him briefly before screaming out loud, You're Edward Bones. The scream was so loud that all the people around stopped walking to look over. Then, they all became excited after seeing him. The woman started to talk rapidly. It's really you. I can't believe I met Edward Bones, the receiver of the Medal for Magical Merit for being one of the most outstanding graduates of Hogwarts, the receiver of the Barnabas Finkei Prize for exceptional spellcasting at the age of 14, the gold medal for groundbreaking contribution to the International Alchemical Conference in Cairo. You have also the youngest receiver of the Order of Merlin, first class, the youngest person to receive the title of Grand Alchemist. Many people said that you will be the next Dumbledore, if not more powerful than him. Oh, Merlin Beard, not to mention your accomplishment as a pioneer. On behalf of women all over the world, I would like to thank you for the ageless potion. If only the effect lasted more than six hours. And, sorry about the terrible exposition dump. I promise the writing gets better than this. Madam, you need to calm down, replied Edward while secretly sighing. If he knew that this would happen, he would have used the flu powder instead. Oh, I'm sorry. My children often say that I talk too much. Speaking of my children, they all have collected your chocolate frog card even my husband does the same thing. Wait, my husband is here and would love to meet you. Furthermore, he has a camera with him. Do you mind if we take a picture together? The woman did not wait for Edward to answer as she ran as swiftly as possible inside the store and returned with her husband. Then, in front of countless people watching, Edward has to take pictures with the woman and sign a few of his books. Using the excuse that he had an important meeting, he left the crowds that were rapidly increasing and met with the clerk. To the interview, I, after Edward entered the store, he had a brief meeting with the store clerk to review the sales in the past few months. Well, the result was as good as before, if not better. The ageless potion that he created is actually a money printing machine. The purpose of this potion is to actually revert a woman's face or visage back to a younger age of their choosing. This potion allows older women to return to their youth, while younger ones can remain at a certain age for a longer period of time. Adding to that, this potion has some beautification effect, using it is like having a permanent social media filter from his past life. Of course, this potion has restrictions. It cannot increase the lifespan of anyone that drinks, it only lasts 6 hours before someone has to drink another dose. Overuse of the potion can build resistance, however, Edward invented another potion that clears out the build-up resistance. With a monopoly in these two potions, plus the Yu-Gi-Oh! dual cards and discs, Edward is a rich man in the magical world. Of course, he did not do all of this because of his family circumstances, but because he needed a lot of money for his research and experiments. 
After checking that everything was all right with the store, Edward used the flu powder to teleport himself to Professor McGonagall's office. Then, he saw the green-robed waiting for him. Professor McGonagall, it's been a while since we met, said Edward with a smile on his face. However, the professor did not respond with a smile of her own. Five years to be exact, Mr. Bones. No one has seen you for more than five years. If it was not for the few scattered letters that you send, many people including me would have thought that you were dead in a dark corner of the world. Professor, you should have more faith in me. I think few things in this world can actually send me off this mortal coil. That is not the point, Edward. You suddenly vanished after graduation. Many people were worried about you. Edward still with a calm smile on his face responded in an apologetic tone. Well, there is a reason for my absence. First, I got lost in my research. Then I got myself into a little trouble. I am well aware of how engrossed you can be when doing magic research. However, that is still not reason enough to behave in such a manner. As for your so-called little trouble, I do not believe that anything that can cause you trouble to be of such insignificance, replied McGonagall as she directed him towards the headmaster's office. After spending the entire journey apologizing to her, they finally arrived in front of the headmaster's office. After the vice headmistress used the password, Edward saluted her before entering in. The first thing that he noticed inside the room was the phoenix fox. He approached it to play with it. So, fox, have you thought about my proposal to abandon the professor and become my companion? I promised you that your life will be much better in the future. Not interested, replied the phoenix with a nonchalant look. An answer which was not surprising to Edward. It truly is a fascinating spell, isn't it? Suddenly ring a voice in the room. Nature's voice, allowing the user the ability to communicate with animals. Honestly speaking, I believe that this is one of the best spells you have created. Professor Dumbledore, replied Edward as he turned around to face the headmaster. You looked as healthy as ever. Thank you. Do you want the usual? If you do not mind. Then, with a wave of the professor's hand, a cup of tea appeared on the seat opposite him. After sitting down and enjoying their tea for a few seconds, Dumbledore looked up and down at Edward with his deep eyes under the small glasses. Has he already reached that hurdle, he thought secretly to himself. This is faster than me and Gellert, and even faster than Tom. After secretly sighing to him, Dumbledore then asked, So, Mr. Edward Bones, where have you been the past five years? After taking a sip of his tea, Edward replied, After you refused my application to be a professor at Hogwarts, I followed your advice. I traveled the entire world. I went to the United States, visited the Amazon forest in South America, toured the pyramids in Egypt. I even went as far as visiting the Soviet Union and China. And I did not only visit the magical side of these worlds but the muggle side as well. As a matter of fact, Edward lied or did not tell the whole truth. He did indeed visit all these countries, but it was not for a vacation. No, it was to steal knowledge. You could say that in the past five years, Edward became the greatest international thief in both the magical and muggle world, leaving countless legends both true and false. 3. The interview, 2. After transmigrated to this world, Edwards was also granted his golden finger, however, his was not some system or mysterious object. It was a perfect memory that allowed him to remember every single thing as long as he focused his mind. His golden finger was essentially the same thing as the mindscape that he has seen in so many fanfictions of his past. However, his was innate. Another golden finger he has was his overwhelming talent for magic. Like Voldemort, at six years old, he could easily control and use magic as if it was a part of him. Whether it was floating things, making them disappear, or lighting things on fire, he could easily do them. Not to mention his overwhelming understanding or comprehensive abilities. Edward could easily learn most spells after reading about them and practice a few times. Magic was natural to him as breathing. However, Edward still had to face some problems when he first transmigrated. One of which was his parents. It turned out that he was born in the midst of the first wizarding war a time where Voldemort's strength was at an all-time high. Wizards and their families were dying every single day. Things turned worse for Edward when he realized that his father was Edgar Bones, the brother of Amelia Bones from the original story and a close member of the Order of Phoenix. Edward knew that his father, mother, and he were fated to die in the war. So, he urged them to stop fighting and run away together. But his Hufflepuff father did not listen to him in the slightest as he continued to fight against Voldemort and his Death Eaters. Knowing that his life was at stake, Edward managed to convince his parents to take certain measures. For example, the Fideliu's charm on their house. As for the secret keeper, Edwards chose the house elf, Momo. The reason for that was due to the fact house elves were extremely loyal to their masters and would rather die than reveal the secret. Another reason was that these guys had the ability to apparate and most anti-apparition of wizards are useless for them. Of course, this was far from the end. Edward's paranoia at that time reached its peak. He had his parents install many muggle weapons in the house, then have them magically altered. So, if someone were to intrude in his house, not only would that person have to get rid of the protective enchantments, they also had to deal with a few Gatling guns. And just like that, Edward lived safely until it was time to attend Hogwarts. In the five years in between, he mastered all seven years of knowledge before even entering school. To protect himself and his family, Edward was real quiet during his first few years of school. He did not want his genius to attract the attention of Voldemort. To be safe, he seldom went out. Even when attending school, 
He did not go through the train but had Momo directly teleport him there. Unfortunately for Edward, at the end of his second grade, he still received the news that his parents were killed during a confrontation with Voldemort. The irony of this was the fact that his parents died the same year that the Dark Lord died. After grieving for his parents, he went to live with his Aunt Amelia. Then, Edward no longer hid his talent. During his time at Hogwarts, he asked all the professors their understanding of magic and spells. After absorbing their knowledge and experiences, he started to make waves in the magic world. He invented countless spells, won countless awards. The Ministry of Magic then used his genius Halo as a form of propaganda to distract wizards from the horror of the war they had just experienced. They packaged him as the next Dumbledore, and Edward lived up to the expectations. He won all the awards the headmaster won when he was young, and even some he did not have the chance to. As for Edward, he used his newfound fame to get in contact with some of the most knowledgeable wizards still alive. He communicated and exchanged ideas with them constantly. After graduation, he wanted to come to teach at Hogwarts, but Dumbledore refused him because he was too young. After that, Edward started to travel the world. And his travel was not for sightseeing but stealing. Using methods like Imperious Curse, Polyjuice Potion, and Human Transfiguration, he infiltrated all the magical schools in the world by impersonating some teachers. Then, he copied all the books in their library. And this method was not only used for those 11 schools. No, he did the same with all the wizard families that have a long heritage. And his grasp did not only reach England but the entire world. Even the muggles were not spared. According to history lessons, Edwards knew that many witches and wizards were hunted in ancient times. So, he theorized that many ancient magic books might be still in the hands of certain muggle authorities. And he was right. After successfully sneaking into the Vatican's secret archive, Edward discovered many real magic books containing lost knowledge. Of course, many of these books were also fake. However, even the fake books inspired him as they provided him with ideas or directions for creating new spells. Of course, during his years as a thief, Edward still encountered a few troubles. Certain people could not be controlled by the Imperious Curse and certain vaults needed specific bloodlines to open. However, this problem was solved by a muggle flower called Devil's Breath. It allowed Edward to eliminate a person's free will and control them to do his bidding. After magically processing this flower, the ability intensified and Edward got away with it. As a result, in the past five years, Edward's knowledge has reached an unimaginable. He could even argue that his knowledge is on PAR with Dumbledore if not stronger. Only two things that he could think that he is worse than the headmaster, his experience in battle, and the number of magical powers inside of him. For the interview, three, headmaster Dumbledore nodded quietly after hearing this, then chewed on a piece of candy. So, what made you want to work at Hogwarts? With your abilities and all the honors or awards you have received, you have so many options. Whether it is to work for the Ministry of Magic or using your wealth to spend the rest of your life in comfort to study magic, you have so many options. So, why be a professor? The professor's deep blue eyes started to scrutinize Edward under his glasses, his gaze deep and penetrating as if he wanted to see through him, see through his soul. As for Edgard, he was very calm the entire process. He took a sip of his tea, looked at the professor in the eyes, and replied, You know, I have always felt it very demeaning the way you always suspect or compare me to him, always watching over me in case I became the next Tom Riddle. No, I should call him Lord Voldemort now. The room instantly became quiet, and the paintings of the former headmasters in the wall gasped while looking at Edward. Some of them, like Phineas, had gleeful smiles on their faces. As for Dumbledore, he was calmed as he chewed on a piece of acid pops without any expression on his face. Well, Edward, you cannot blame me for this. After all, you started rising right after Tom fell, and the similarities between the two of you were too much to ignore. You had the same unparalleled talent. In your case, your magical abilities even surpassed his at the same age. You had the same desire for power. Desire for knowledge, professor, suddenly said Edward. I pursue knowledge, not power. Power is nothing but the consequence for my search for the truth. That may be true, but that did not change the fact that by the fourth grade, you were already considered a master of the dark arts, replied the professor with a deep and powerful gaze. As for Edward, he was calmed as he shook his head, my views on the subject of the dark arts is not to shun or fear it, but to understand its origins and essence. Dark magic is as much part of wizards as white magic. Although I understand that dark arts can influence the user's mind, precautions can be used to manage such side effects. Edward, it is a great form of arrogance to believe that a person can control such terrible and terrifying power without being lost by it, replied the professor with a little sadness in his voice. And it is a great ignorance to simply ignore a power that we know exists in this world, a power that will not go away and always remain a part of every wizarding society. Not to mention the impact and significance it can have on the world both positive and negative. A perfect example of this can be found during the Wizarding War. The Death Eaters used dark magic to terrorize the world by brutally killing many people. However, the war started to turn around as soon as Barty Crouch passed the law that allowed the Aurors to use the three unforgivable curses. Dark arts are not inherently bad nor any less harmful than white magic. In the end, it all comes down to the will and choice of the user. The room then became quiet again. The two people talking in this room are some of the most powerful and knowledgeable wizards in the world. As such, they each had their own ideas, will, beliefs and philosophies. 
so, it is not easy to change their mind. After a few minutes of silence, Edward looked at the window while saying, You know, I used to be as ambitious as Tom, if not more when I was young. Oh, how so? Once, my dream or goal was to build a true wizard civilization. I would gather all the wizards in the world, pooled all our knowledge and resources together to push the civilization of wizards forwards towards a bright future. Then, we would explore the universe. Muggle scientists have already determined how vast the universe is and how our planet is nothing but a small piece of dust in a small solar system. They have started to wonder whether there are other life forms out there, what kind of other civilization exists in the cosmos. Edward took a sip of his tea, however, it had turned cold while he was talking. He waved his hand, then steam started to come out of his cup again. After knowing about this, I started to ask myself the same question as to them. Are there any wizards out there on different planets in the universe? And if so, how powerful are they? What kind of knowledge do they have? Is their magic different from ours? Then, my dream was to slowly guide the wizards on this planet to slowly explore the stars and come in contact with these other civilizations. Maybe we could exchange knowledge and resources with them. Can you imagine how prosperous the wizarding world would be after having access to other civilizations? The world would enter a blooming age of progress. Countless wizards from all over the world would come together to create new spells, potions, and alchemy products. We would discover countless unknown magical creatures and plants. We would study the mysteries of time, space, death, and love. We would unravel the potential of the human mind, find the secrets of the soul, control the different energy and forces of the world, and leave our trail in the cosmos. Wizards would no longer be just ordinary mortals that have some special abilities, but long-living beings that pursue the truth and laws of the world. And things did not stop there. According to Muggle scientists, there are countless dimensions and other universes that possibly exist out there. According to them, some of these dimensions are simply beyond human understanding or have laws that are completely different from our own. These Muggle scientists cannot truly prove the existence of these dimensions or universes, but magic can. After all, we wizards have found ways to travel through both space and time. As long as we study these spells and modify them, who can say we could not find the existence of these dimensions? Then, the footsteps of our civilization will not only spread through the stars but also across multiple dimensions. 5. The interview. 4. The room became silent after Edward's grand speech. Whether it was Dumbledore or the painting of the headmaster, they all started to imagine how beautiful such a prosperous world would be. Wizards would truly become powerful beings that control the world, or multiple worlds. They would have long lives to pursue their dreams and goals, and they may even eventually conquer death. Haha, <laughs> Edward, only a noble pure blood like yourself could create such a beautiful world, suddenly said Headmaster Phineas Black. However, Headmistress Dilly Sterwent gave him a cold look, but he ignored it. Noble family, huh, replied Edward. In the world I envisioned, the concept of a noble family would have existed, but not because of bloodlines. No, it was simply based on abilities and achievement. If a wizard is powerful enough and contributed enough to the wizarding world, of course, he would be granted wealth and noble status. However, if his descendants are mediocre, then they would only be privy to the wealth and heritage of their families. No power or status would be granted after more than three generations if the descendants do not meet a certain requirement. Although Phineas was a little sad about this information, he could still accept the fact that noble families would still exist in this utopian world. As for the other portraits, they looked at him with gleeful smirks. As for Dumbledore, he had a slightly surprised look in his eyes after imagining the world that Edward envisioned, then he soon calmed himself down and looked at it from a critical point of view. The making of such a civilization will never be peaceful and would be followed by blood and war. Not to mention how easy it is for wizards to lose themselves with so much power. And in a more realistic tone, what about the muggles? How do they fit in your grand plan? You are right, professor. The wizard civilization would have to commit countless atrocities to reach the level I envisioned, but tell me, what great civilization has not done such a thing to achieve their grandeur and glory? This is just an inevitable thing, replied Edward with a calm look on his face. As for the muggle? Actually, they are one of the reasons that I gave up all my ambitions. What, you gave up? asked Phineas. A few minutes ago, he was thinking maybe one of the future heirs of his black family might one day find a method to revive him from this painting. Although he would have to ask Edward to take care of his last bloodline and ensure that he has descendants. But he still had some hope. And it was not just Phineas that was surprised, many of the other portraits were too. However, Dumbledore was not. He took notice of the fact that Edward used the past tense when mentioning his ambitions, implying that there were no longer his goals. However, Edward just ignored the portraits as he continued to enjoy his tea. You know, I once started thinking about the future of wizards, do you mind hearing my opinion? If you do not mind, replied Dumbledore with an intrigued look on his face. I believe that a war with the Muggle is an inevitable thing, and it will not be started by wizards, not if things remain the way they are. As Muggle science and technology continue to evolve, they will eventually discover wizards, then war will take place. Unfortunately, I do not believe for a second that wizards have a chance of winning such a war. Nonsense, roared Phineas Black, full of fury on his face. And it was not just him, many other portraits had similar thoughts as him. Edward looked at the painting with a calm look, do you know that muggles landed on the moon more than 20 years ago? What does that have to do with anything? Asked Phineas with a frown on his already serious face. 
I'm saying this to tell you how advanced muggle science and technology and the rapid pace at which they are developing. Now, let's look at us wizards, what was our greatest achievement in the past few decades? What major achievements that can change the world in the past few years? The only thing that I can think of is the Philosopher's Stone, however, that was created more than 600 hundred years ago. Not to mention that the stone did not contribute to the wizarding world in the slightest. Muggles have already begun to explore the stars, while we still have laws from the Middle Age. For Merlin's sake, we have space magic, but we have not even reached the moon yet. Even worse, no one even had the idea of actually exploring the moon. Well, I'm sure that some idiot wizard once had the idea of reaching the moon, then took his broom to try to reach there and die in the vacuum of space. However, that does not count. All a wizard needs to do to win a war against the Muggle is to use the Imperious Curse to control all the higher echelons of the Muggles and use their powerful weapons against them, argued Phineas. That's not going to work as much as you think. It is common knowledge that any person with strong will can wake up from the Imperious Curse. Do you think that with the more than 7 billion Muggles, there will not be people with will strong enough not to be affected by the Imperious Curse? So according to you, the wizard will come to an end after we lose the war to Muggles, suddenly asked one of the portraits. No, replied Edward while shaking his head. On the contrary, it's the opposite. After losing the war, wizards will start to flourish afterward. 6. The interview, V. How is that possible? If the Muggles won the war, they would kill all of us wizards, exclaimed one of the portraits. No, you are wrong. After winning the war, the Muggles will become curious about us, they would lust and envy our powers. Although this war would have proven that science and technology are no worse or even better than magic, their desires to become special or unique will get the best of them. As such, they will study wizards thoroughly. For a long period of time, I imagine that wizards will become nothing but experimental subjects, little lab rats in a laboratory. The muggles will try to find the source of the power of our magical powers. I believe that they will succeed. It may take him some time, but they will eventually succeed. After that, they will want to grant such power to muggles. And I also believe that they will succeed in that endeavor. Then, a brand new group of wizards will rise from muggle society. Let's call them neo-muggle wizards. These individuals will start to combine magic with technology, thus creating a brand new magical civilization. And with the large population of muggles, even if only 1% of them can actually turn into neo-muggle wizard, the number of wizards then will still be exponentially more than the current time. After that, the neo-muggle wizards with their advanced thinking from science and technology will also explore the universe and countless dimensions, thus creating a prosperous age or civilization of wizards. Preposterous? Absurd? The very notion of your words is ludicrous, yelled Phineas Black, who seemed very agitated. All the other portraits had similar ideas as him, but they tried to remain calm. Calm down, Phineas, said Dumbledore who was not as calmed as he appeared on the surface. This is just a hypothetical future. There is no need to become so riled up. Phineas Black then looked at Edward with a fierce look, then closed his eyes and shut off his senses. Or at the very least, it appeared to be doing so. As for Dumbledore, he was a little shaken as this was the second time in his life that a powerful wizard warned him of the future danger of the wizarding world. His old friend had tried to use radical methods to deal with the problem, while the one in front of him seemed rather indifferent. Edward, you mentioned that this was one of the reasons that you gave up your ambitions, what is the other reason? Edward pondered for a few seconds before answering, it was because of my parents. After their deaths, I came to a realization, Voldemort did not kill them, but the wizard world did. Voldemort is a result of all the things wrong with our society. Whether it is the wanton discrimination or racism of those pure-blood theorists, the social inequality between muggle-born wizards, half-bloods, and pure-bloods, the backward mindset of wizards for millennia, or the superiority complex of most wizards towards other races both magical and non-magical. All these problems resulted in the creation of Voldemort, thus leading to the death of my parents. In my mind, the Dark Lord was not the only person that killed them, but the wizarding world. Why would I lead this kind of people to create such a prosperous civilization? Are they worthy? The room became quiet again. Many of the portraits had a complex look on their faces as they looked at Edward, and they sighed to themselves. As for Dumbledore, he also sighed before saying, I'm sorry Edward about your parents, however, I do not think you should judge the entire wizard world because of a minority few. There are plenty of good-hearted people in the wizarding world willing to do good things. A perfect example is your parents. When Voldemort was in power, they rose to the occasion and fought for what is right. You may be right, Professor. But do not forget that the minority few that you talked about are actually the ones with all the power and influence in the wizarding world. The room once again entered a brief period of silence. As a matter of fact, Edward did not tell the whole truth. One of the main reasons that he did continue with his ambitions was because he realized that he did not really need the help of the wizarding world to accomplish his goals slash. With his talent and relentless pursuit of magic, he strongly believes that he will one day discover the way to travel through dimensions and other universes. After that, his journey through the sea of stars and dimensions will begin. He will pursue the path of magic until he becomes one of the most powerful wizards in countless dimensions and universes. His legend will spread throughout many realities, and he will be able to control his own fate. And the first step of his grand plan will begin after he acquires the Philosopher's Stone. This is one of the reasons that he decided to come to teach at Hogwarts. Well Mr. Bones, let's get back to the interview. 
So, for what reason you decided to come to teach here at Hogwitz? I have had many great memories in this castle. In many ways, it is a second home to me, so I thought of coming back. Furthermore, I have been lusting after the books in the restricted area. Unfortunately, you always prevented me from entering there. Dumbledore just smiled before asking a few other questions for the interview, then Edward left. Dumbledore was left alone in the room with his thoughts, then Phineas Black said, What a scary guy. What do you mean? Asked one of the portraits. I do not believe for once that a person who can come up with such a goal and ideal to just give up like that. In most likelihood, he discovered a way to accomplish these things on his own, replied Phineas with a sneer on his face. Then, the portrait of Dilly Sturwind asked, So, what are you going to do, Dumbledore? Are you going to hire him? Seven material after Edward left the headmaster's room, he used the flu network to return to a house he has in Hogsmeade. He did not want to go home yet as he knew that his aunt would reprimand him. However, he also knew that his arrival would be in the headline of the Daily Prophet tomorrow morning, telling all wizards of his return. In this world, Edward is almost as famous as Harry Potter himself. Later that night, Edward placed a hood himself, then operat to a deserted mountain, waiting for someone. A few hours later, it was not one person that showed up, but ten of them, all of them surrounded him. Edward calmly took out his wand, it was fourteen inches long made of oak wood with a sphinx core. With a wave of his wand, an invisible sword cut the closest person to him in half. This was Snape's Sectum Sempra spell. All the other people were shocked by the sudden death of their companion. Then, all of them chant different incarnations, throwing more than nine spells towards Edwards. However, he just waved his hand, then a semi-transparent shield appeared in front of him, blocking all the spells. Some of them were bounced back to the group. However, the majority of them managed to use the protego charm to protect themselves, while the others moved out the way to dodge. Unfortunately for those who dodged, they were separated from the group. Edward took advantage of this situation. He turned into a cloaking shadow and disappeared from the spot and reappeared behind one of the separated groups. A red light appeared from his white hand, making it look like a lightsaber. With a swing of his wand, he cut the two people in front of him into two sections, leaving burn marks on their torso. Edward looked satisfied at this spell that he created because he was a Star Wars fan in his past life. While Edward was a little distracted, someone used the Avada Kedavra curse on him, thus a green light rushed towards him. However, he moved his body aside and dodged the attack. Then, with a wave of his hand, the ground turned into metal spikes that turned the person that used the unforgivable curse into Swiss cheese. At this point, Edward had already killed four people, which made the remaining six very nervous. One person decided to use apparition to leave this place. However, with another wave of Edward's wand, a powerful pulling force appeared and intervened in this guy's apparition. As a result, his head was separated from his body. Then, Edward tapped his hand in the air, following which, a strange vibration was released from his wand and blended in the void. Then, the remaining five people discovered that it was impossible to apparate and leave here. This was another invented spell of Edward after studying the ant-apparition enchantment in Hogwarts Castle. The five people knowing that they were not a match for the single-hooded wizard decided to band together. Then, they all said in unison, Protego. A large shield appeared by combining the power of all five of them. Edward frowned for a little after seeing this, then he said, Bomarda Maxima. Then, a powerful explosion was sent from his wand. The shield of these five wizards only lasted a few seconds, before it was blown to pieces along with them. Afterward, all that was left of these people were broken pieces of their bodies along with massive amounts of blood. Roberti, I know you are here, so show yourself, suddenly said Edward while looking in a certain direction. Following this, another hooded wizard appeared in the direction he was looking for. Edward Bones, my friend, it is nice to hear from you again. Roberti, if you do not give me an explanation, I can assure you that you will end up the same way as those wizards. My friend, you cannot blame me for being cautious. You have not contacted me for more than two years, then I suddenly received your letter. Edward sneered at these words. He knew how these dark wizards think and behave. If you show them any form of weakness, they will not hesitate to betray and devour you whole. You know that this is not enough to convince me. How about doubling the material, however, you do not need to pay extra. Consider it my way of apologizing, replied Roberti. Fine. Roberti then sighed in relief. Despite his calm facade, he was extremely terrified inside. He spent so many years and resources training these ten wizards to the level of Aurors. Adding on top of their proficiency in dark magic, they were more than enough to take on more than 15 ordinary wizards. However, they were all annihilated in just a few minutes, and effortlessly at that. After making sure that Edward accepted his proposition, Roberti waved his hand and ten people appeared on the ground. However, these people were chained and also incapacitated. Edward walked to one of these people and pointed his wand at his head, reveal yourself. Then the person's head started to turn into a wolf, but before he could fully transform, he stopped. Then, he checked the remaining nine. All of them are werewolves that have committed many crimes and atrocities. You should be satisfied, right? No problem, replied Edward calmly. Then, can you remove your anti-apparition spell? So, Edward waved his hand to do so. As he watched Roberti disappear in front of him, he thought to himself, it's time to get rid of Roberti. He is starting to become a liability. After thinking that, Edward took a bag from his cloak, and with a wave of his wand, all the werewolves were sent inside. 
This bag was enchanted with an extension charm. Then, he placed his wand inside the mouth of the bag, Oxyo Roberti's hair. Then, a black string of hair appeared in his hand. Following this, Edward started chanting in a weird language while doing a strange dance. Then, he took out a white powder and blew it on the string of hair. A black shadowy like smoke appeared on the hair, then it disappeared. This was a powerful voodoo curse that Edward learned when he one day accidentally teleported to Haiti in one of his magical experiments. It required strict preparations beforehand and a ceremony to take effect. He had anticipated that Roberti might cause him trouble in the future, so be prepared for the worse. Tomorrow morning, Roberti will be found with a look of horror on his face with his heart missing from his body. After that, Edward used his wand again, then a powerful acid appeared, dissolving all the bodies and the blood clean, not leaving a single trace. Then with another wave of his wand, he used another spell to prevent anyone from recreating the scene that appeared here. After finishing all of this, he operat home. Eight discovery after arriving home, Edward entered one of the rooms, this room had only a briefcase lying in the center and there were many protection enchantments around it. Then, he entered inside the suitcase, which had a very powerful extension charm just like Newt Scamander's case. Inside this suitcase was actually very large, with countless rooms inside of it. To be precise, this was Edward's laboratory where he did his magical experiments. After entering one of the rooms, Edward saw the ten werewolves lying on the ground unconscious. As a matter of fact, these people were not the strangest things in this room. All over the room, there were many gigantic tubes with many creatures lying in a greenish liquid. There were dragons, hippogriffs, house elves, vampires, mermaids, etc. And on the shelves, there were many organs of these animals lying on there. The reason for those things was because Edward was studying bloodline. So, he bought and captured all kinds of magical creatures both normal and dark and dissecting them. He basically treated them as biological experiments. Edward wanted to find what made these magical animals different from ordinary animals, he also wanted to find the origin of their bloodlines. At the age of 17, Edward reached a major bottleneck in his growth as a wizard, his magical powers stopped growing. A year before, he invented a potion that accelerated the growth of his magical powers. Then, in just a year, his magical powers reached the level of 25 times that of a normal adult wizard, then it stopped growing. The potion did not actually increase his magical powers, but just accelerated the rate that it grows until it reaches its limits. After reaching this limit, Edward thought that this was the highest level it could reach until he realized that Dumbledore had a magical power 50 times that of a normal adult wizard. After discovering this, Edward did further research, then he realized that 25 was actually a limit, and the most talented wizards can reach. And the majority have to spend all their lives to allow their magical powers to reach that level. However, his potions allowed him to reach that level at such a young age. However, the problem came, how did Dumbledore break that limit? And was he the only one? After turning into one of the guards, he visited Nurmengard Castle and took a look at Grindelwald. And as expected, this first generation of Dark Lord also broke that limit and reached the level of 50 times the magical powers of a normal adult wizard. After that, Edward theorized that these talented people have found a way to break that limit. He guessed that Voldemort probably did it too and probably used the Horcruxes to break that barrier. He guessed that Dumbledore used the Phoenix Fox as a way to break that barrier, while Grindelwald might have used either the Elder Wand or some other method. As for him, he chose the path of the bloodline to break that barrier. Edward theorized that the first wizards that ever existed were due to surviving an accident after ingesting the blood of powerful magical animals, thus granting them a bloodline of their own. So, he believed that as long as he discovered the bloodline of wizards, then modified it, he could break that barrier and open the gate to a brand new world. To further his study, Edward stole a few technological machines designed to observe DNA. However, these machines did not reveal much information at the time due to the low level of technology. So, he took drastic measures. He traveled around the world and contacted some of the most intelligent scientists and engineers in the world. Using force, coercion, or even magic, he forced them to work together to invent the technology he needs for his research. He then secretly controlled some of the richest people in the world to fund this research. So with unlimited funds, access to all the rare resources in the world, the technology Edward needed was created in just one year. After entering his laboratory, Edward woke up one of the werewolves, the lad was confused about where he was, however, he was easily controlled through blood magic similar to blood bending of Avatar. Edward first took him into a white room separated by an observing glass, then with a wave of his hand, an alchemy product designed to give off moonlight shone on the werewolf. Then, Edward activated the machine that observed his DNA. Of course, this was not the original machine, but one that was further modified by Edward through magic. He observed all the changes that occurred in this man's DNA, however, he still did not find what he was looking for. With a wave of his wand, someone appeared in the same room as the werewolf, it was a muggle. Without hesitation, the muggle was bitten by the werewolf, however, he was separated from the wolf before he was ripped apart. Then, Edward watched calmly and indifferently at the changes in the muggle's DNA. The reason that he chose werewolves was that they were the few creatures that could actually change the bloodline of both muggles and wizards through saliva and blood. So, Edward believed that as long as he observed the bloodline transformation of any wizards or muggles, he could find the place the bloodline originated from and study it. 9 Discovery, 2, Edward watched the muggle transform into a werewolf, 
However, he did not feel magical powers from him nor did he find anything in his DNA. He felt that he was close to something, but he could not discover exactly what it was. After pondering for a while, Edward went to the next room. This room was full of all kinds of potions. There were a few hundred vials, some were empty while the others had some sort of liquid on them, with the name of the potion written underneath them. After a few minutes of searching, he found a white vial with a molten golden color liquid and the tag Felix Felicis underneath. This potion was the liquid luck personally brewed by Edward himself. Without hesitation, Edward drank the potion. After feeling the unfounded confidence overcoming him, he smiled before returning to his research room. With a wave of his hand, another person appeared in the same room as the previous werewolf. However, this who appeared was in fact a captured dark wizard instead of a muggle. After allowing them to bite the wizard and separating the two of them, Edward started to observe the DNA structure of the dark wizard. This time, things went smoothly for Edward. Somewhere along the double helix, he discovered a very tiny magical energy, so he focused on that place to see what it was. However, the machine could not find anything. Edward's intuition told him that he found what he was looking for, but he could not see it. Then, he remembered that muggles could not see some magical creatures like Dementors. So he thought that maybe the machine could not actually see what he was looking for. Although these machines were magically modified, it did not change the fact that they were technological base. Maybe what he is looking for is more metaphysical or spiritual. After figuring this out, Edward tried another method. He used all kinds of spells that are related to vision. Whether it was the supersensory charm or other charms that he created after dissecting the eyeballs of countless magical creatures. He placed all of them on him, then he concentrated on the specific spot that the machine first discovered. And then, Edward saw it, it was as if he entered a different world and that world was full of unintelligible scribbles. There were all kinds of strange symbols, glyphs, and pictures. It took him a while to really focus on these scribbles before discovering some sort of pattern. Then, Edward realized that these unintelligible scribbles were actually ancient rune language. He had studied it back in Hogwarts under the tutelage of Professor Bathsheba babbling. Edward spent a great deal of time studying ancient runes as they were used in many ancient manuscripts, so he could write and read them fluently. Furthermore, some of the people he corresponded with regularly are actually real scholars of ancient runes that have studied the subject for decades. After taking a few hours to translate the ancient rune, Edward was left with a complete shock with his discovery. What he discovered was something he referred to as life code, and as the name states, it is the fundamental code or engineer of the human body. It is divided into three parts, body, soul, and bloodline. The body part is essentially the DNA of a person and it dictates everything about the human body, hair, skin color, and other types of genetic information. As for the other two parts, they are self-explanatory as they dictate the composition of the soul and the kind of bloodline of a person. Edward became excited after making this discovery as he knew that he was really close to solving his problem of magical power. So, he focused more on the bloodline section of the life code. He discovered that muggles also have a life code, but the bloodline section is empty, while the soul section has very little compared to wizards. Edward's mind started to revolve rapidly as he wondered how different the bloodline section of people like Voldemort or Nymphadora Tonks would be as they are born with innate abilities. Edward knew that he could not get access to Voldemort's blood to study, but he could still get Tonks. As Metamorphmagus, her bloodline must be different from other people. Furthermore, Edward is still interested in the relationship between bloodline and soul. Voldemort's bloodline granted him the ability of Parcel Tongue, but Harry Potter acquired the same ability after a piece of the Dark Lord's soul entered his body. So, there must be a correlation. After reigning in his thoughts, Edward then concentrated on the aspect of the bloodline that deals with magical powers. The next problem that he faced was how to actually modify this life code. Then, he suddenly thought of transfiguration, to be precise, human transfiguration. As this is magic that can transform the molecular structure of the human body from one thing to another, it should be able to affect this life code. With this newfound idea, Edward set out to test his theory. He first places the newly transformed wizard on a dissecting bench, strapped him off so he could not escape, then he begins his attempt. Things went much smoother than Edward anticipated. He instantly felt a connection directly to this wizard's life code, so he tried to modify one part in his bloodline. However, things went horribly wrong. The wizard started to scream, blood started to come out of his mouth, ears, and nose. After a few seconds of having a seizure, he died. After checking his conditions, it turned out that his DNA collapsed and his life code became a mess. Edward frowned as he realized that things were more complex than he originally thought. With a wave of his wand, this wizard was sent to the disposal area, then he placed one of the werewolves he just bought on the bench and repeated the experiment. No matter how many of these experimental materials die, he will uncover the mystery of bloodline, and even of the entire life code. Ten mind soothing soon, seven days passed by. Edward looked at the dead wizards in front of him with a frown on his face. In the past week, he had killed all ten werewolves he just bought, plus another five dark wizards he had in store. However, he made little progress. A thing like the life code is very complex, so modifying even a tiny part of it will lead to another chain of events that affects the other parts. As such, it is not an easy thing to modify at will. Nevertheless, Edward did learn a few new things especially about magic cores. Long ago, he had discovered that every wizard had a magic core that held its magic powers. 
According to his previous research, wizards had a few different shapes of cores, some were round, triangular, and cubic, and wards had a cubic-shaped one. As a matter of fact, even squibs have a magic core inside, however, theirs is inactive. In his previous study, he tried to transplant the magic core of one wizard into the body of another in an attempt to increase his magic powers. But, he failed after solving many difficult problems, the first of which was taking out the magic core. Just like the life code, the magic core was a metaphysical thing that could not be seen or accessed under normal circumstances. However, after discovering a way to actually taking out of the body and plant it in someone's else, two things would happen. Either it was of no use and no effect would take place, or a powerful rejection would occur, leading to the death of the person who received the transfer. Previously, Edward did not know the real reason behind this rejection, but after studying the life code, he knew that bloodline did decide whether someone had a magic core, however, the core was also linked to the soul. As such, each core had the imprint of its owner. So, when it was transplanted into another person's body, this led to severe rejection. After finishing his last experiment, Edward took a break as he did not have any more experimental bodies. And also because he ran out of ideas. If he continued like this, a lot of people would have to die before he actually discovered the intricacies of the life code, so he needed a better and more efficient way to continue his research. Maybe I should observe a pregnant witch, that way I can slowly observe how the life code of a baby is developed from its inception all the way to its birth, thought Edward to himself. However, he soon stopped his thought with a serious look on his face. He realized a problem with his mind or thinking. Although he is a person who is willing to go to extreme lengths for his research, he did not reach the level of experimenting on children. He still had a bottom line. So, the only reason he thought like this was that something was wrong with his mindset. Knowing this, Edward left his laboratory. After exiting the suitcase, he left his manor at Hogsmeade and Operat at an alley in the Muggle world. After spending a few minutes searching for the information he needed, Edward then Operat again, this time he arrived at a concert in London. Many Muggles were happily dancing and singing, overall, they were happy while enjoying themselves. After moving to a corner, Edward took out his wand. Expecto Petronum, he said while waving his hand. A giant eagle burst out from his wand and flew into the sky. The wingspan of this eagle was actually a dozen feet long. However, the odd thing was this patroness was in fact invisible to all the people dancing. After the patroness appeared, it soared in the sky, opened its mouth, and did a swallowing motion. Then, countless silver lights flew from the muggles and were swallowed by the patroness. This was in fact a technique developed by Edward after studying Dementors. What the patroness was swallowing was all the happy memories of these people. However, unlike the Dementors, it did not harm the muggles. The patroness just made sure that the happiest memories of these muggles appear in their minds, then it absorbed the positive energy. After finishing the absorption process, the patroness became a few times larger than its normal size. Then, it returned to Edward and plunged straight into his body. Following this, Edward felt a profound sense of euphoria, then all the negative thoughts in his mind seemed to wash away, his head became exceedingly clear. Edward knew that dark arts has the ability to negatively affect the mind of the user especially for wizards like him that pursue very deep knowledge of it. To ensure his safety, he modified the patroness charm which is known as the guardian spirit to protect him from the side effect of practicing dark magic. Although Edward can be cruel in his pursuit of magic, he was never a dark wizard, nor did he ever considered himself to be one. This was perfectly proven by the fact that he has the ability to perform the patroness charm. To perform this spell, a wizard needs to remember happy memories in his mind, and Edward has plenty of these especially with his parents. Back during the first wizarding war, his parents always made sure that he had a happy childhood even though they would leave every night to fight Voldemort and his Death Eaters. And after their deaths, his Aunt Amelia made sure that he had everything he needed. Although she might seem very strict, that was only when it came to strangers and also a necessity to do her job. Furthermore, Edward made sure to enjoy his life, after all, he died once and he did not believe that he would have a third chance. Additionally, he pursues magic, not due to power, but because it makes him excited. Every time he made a discovery, Edward always felt a sense of satisfaction. It was as if the goddess of magic was in front of him, then he started to slowly unveil her skirts. Even if he manages to lift the skirt a few millimeters, it would bring him a sense of anticipation and euphoria as he believed that one day, he would see what is underneath. In conclusion, Edward is not someone that focuses only on studying magic, he often enjoys himself when given the opportunity. A perfect example of this was his five years traveling the world. He did not just steal a bunch of books and do magic research all day. No, he experienced different cultures, different foods, and different types of women. Overall, he enjoyed himself during travel as much as possible. After leaving the concert, Edward took a mirror and placed his wand on it, then he sent a message. Are you available now? No, you can come by if you want, replied the mirror a few minutes afterward. Eleven inspired after Edward received the reply from the mirror, he returned to his own house and used the flu powder to travel somewhere else. As soon as he arrived, he saw a beautiful woman waiting for him. She looked to be in her late thirties, however, she had a more refined and noble temperament surrounding her. Not to mention that her age added a level of maturity that was quite appealing. As soon Edward arrived, she jumped into his arms and they started to kiss each other passionately for a few deep seconds. Edward, I have not seen you for more than five years. 
Well, I have been busy. Let's not talk about these kinds of things. You looked as ravishing as the day that I met you. Well, your aging potion works wonders for me. Couldn't you make it last longer, or even permanent? If I did that, how would I make money? That's true. Sometimes I wonder whether you are a Slytherin instead of a Ravenclaw. Well, the Sorting Hat did hesitate before choosing where to place me. Fortunately, my passion for knowledge superseded my ambitions. Then, the two of them started to snug each other again. However, midway through, Edward stopped again to ask, I'm guessing that your husband is not here. No he left with the kids and won't be back for a few hours. Then, those two people started to remove each other's clothes even before they reached the next room. A few hours later, Edward was lying in a bed, with another naked body in his arm, he was in deep thought. After a few hours of exercise, his mind became even more clear and another idea just came to him. The werewolf bit is like a virus that can transform a person's bloodline, as such, it can also change a person's life code. What he has to do is isolate the specific things whether it is a virus or a specific protein and find a way to control them. Then, he can effectively find a way to change the life code. Of course, this method would only allow him to turn people into werewolves without biting them, and even reverse the process. The next step would be to modify the virus to be able to affect all aspects of the life code. Of course, Edward has not given up on his idea of slowly observing babies and how their life codes are slowly formed. However, he will only use animals and creatures that are very close to humans. Maybe I should subdue a few Death Eaters like Bellatrix Lestrange and have them do the dirty work that I am not willing to do. However, her craziness is a major problem, suddenly thought Edward. Then, he looked at the woman next to him that was staring at him. So Lyle, if you have something to say, just do it. I am just wondering if you have found a solution to Astoria's blood curse? After all, I do not want anything to happen to my daughter. And, for anyone who is wondering, no she will not be the main heroine. Just one of Edward's many flings. I did find a solution, however, according to my latest research, I can probably forever remove the curse from your Greengrass family lineage. Just give me some time and send me a few vials of her blood, then everything will be fine. So Lyle nodded, then the two of them remained quiet while snuggling each other for half an hour. Then, Edward got out of bed. With a wave of his hand, all his clothes that were scattered throughout the room magically flew towards him and put themselves on him. Meanwhile, while Edward was dressing, so Lyle suddenly said, you know it's real for me. What do you mean, asked Edward without looking back. At first, I was attracted by your talents and wanted to use you to help Astoria with her diseases. But, as time passes, what I feel for you becomes real. If one day you wanted me to leave my husband, I would do so without any hesitation. After finishing fixing his tie Edward then replied, I am aware of this, dear. However, there is no need to ruin something that is already perfect by adding complexity to it. After saying that, he walked to the fireplace and used floor powder to return to his manor. Although he enjoyed Solyle's beauty and companionship, it did not mean he wanted her as a companion especially given her ideas of pure blood theory. Although due to his relationship she has toned it down a bit, she did not change her core values. If Edward himself was not considered a pure blood wizard, he doubted whether she would go to the length of seducing him to cure her daughter's blood curse. After returning to his house, Edward sat in a chair while thinking about the design of his next experiment and his future. Momo, he suddenly called. Then, a house elf dressed in a small suit appeared in front of him. This house elf was as ugly as the other ones, however, it was dressed properly and had learned proper manners. She has been accompanying Edward ever since he was six years old. Even when he traveled the world after his graduation, she would be with him. She is probably the only person who truly knows the shenanigans that Edward went through in the past five years of his absence. Any important letters in the past week? Two, sir. One from Hogwarts and the other from Madame Amelia Bones. Edward took the letter from Hogwarts and read it quietly. There wasn't much on the letter except the fact that he would be the new alchemy teacher at Hogwarts this coming September. What does my aunt's letter say? The house elf Momo opened the second letter before replying a few seconds later. The madam insisted that you come to see her for dinner tonight, otherwise she would send a thousand roaring letters every day to you, master. Furthermore, she emphasizes that if that does not work, she will have Aurors come to arrest you on account of some bogus charge. Edward smiled as he knew that his aunt was capable of such a thing. Reply to her that I will be in time for dinner. 12 The gate after answering the two most important letters, Edward then spent the next few hours responding to other letters. As he had correspondence with some of the most powerful and influential wizards of this world, he had a lot of letters to answer. In his correspondence, they would discuss all kinds of topics, from potions to alchemy, from transfiguration to spells. There are also ancient runes and even the dark arts. All the people he talked to are masters in the fields, leaders of associations, and even members of Britain's Wisengamot and the International Confederation of Wizards. Although he always kept in touch with these people during his five years absence, it was only on rare occasions. But now, with news of his return circulating in the Daily Prophet, many people knew that he had shown and sent him many letters. After finishing his correspondence, Edward went to a specific room in his house. This room was even more guarded than the one he placed his briefcase in. There were so many protective enchantments in this room that it made Hogwarts look like a children's toy. Even house elves could not apparate inside this room. Edward has spent a great deal studying the magic of house elves to create anti-apparition enchantments for them. 
not to mention all the terrible curses he placed on the entrance of this room. If someone other than him were to open this door, they would die a very miserable death. Inside the room was a massive metal-like door full of strange symbols. The door was emanating powerful magical powers. The space around this gate was fluctuating greatly, and there was even a slight temporal wave coming from. This door was called the Gate of World by Edward. Although it had a grandiose name, it was not as powerful as its moniker would imply. However, one could see the grand ambition of its creator. Ever since Edward transmigrated to this world, he wondered why he came here. More importantly, he wondered whether there were other worlds out there based on the movies, books, and TV shows of his past life. And there were, how could he get there? So, he started to study any magic related to space and time to break the dimension wall of the Harry Potter world and reach these other worlds. After years of studying things like apparition, flu powder, and the flu network, and port keys, Edward created this gate based on all his findings. This gate of world is his greatest alchemical invention pooling in together all of his magical knowledge. He had encountered many troubles before he could acquire all the knowledge to create this gate. A perfect example of that was the fact that flu powder was only created by one company in the entire magical world, and they were very secretive. It took Edward a lot of planning to get the recipe. Unfortunately for him, he has not reached the level he desires. This gate can allow him to teleport anywhere he wants in this world even breaking through Hogwarts and the Ministry of Magic's anti-apparitions enchantment. It even allowed him to teleport to anywhere in the solar system as long as the coordinates are calculated correctly. However, he was nowhere near his objective of crossing through dimensions. Edward knew that he needed to also use the power of time to accomplish his goals, so he tried to study the time turner. However, in the third grade, when he tried to acquire one by taking all the classes at Hogwarts, Dumbledore did not allow him to get one. So, he had to use his family connection in the Ministry of Magic to get it. However, his results have been very disappointing. Despite how powerful this gate is, it can only travel back in time for three hours, even less than an actual time turner. Not to mention that he did not find a way to combine both the space force and time force in the gate, it can only use one of them at a time. This is one of the reasons that Edward decided to go back to Hogwarts, there are many things he planned to use the plot to acquire. Then there is also the fact that he hoped to find something useful in the restricted area of the library. After spending a few hours researching the Gate of World, it was already time for his dinner with his aunt. So, Edward took a quick shower and changed his outfit. Inside the Bones family manor, Edward was sitting at a dining table with a fork and knife in his hand. Opposite him sat a middle-aged witch who was staring at him deeply with a strict look on her face. Now that you have turned into an adult, you think you can do whatever you want? Asked Amelia Bones as she slowly placed a piece of chicken in her mouth. Aunt, there is no need to be mad. Before I left, I told you about what was going to happen. That does not absolve you of the fact that I barely saw you for five years straight. To be fair, you are the only person who received a weekly letter from me. Amelia scoffed after hearing this. So, I should be grateful that my nephew whom I have raised as my son sent me one letter a week notifying me that he is still well and alive. Edward then almost choked on his food after hearing this, so he said, how is work going? Trying to change the subject. Do not think that this is the end of things. As for work at the ministry, it is just fine. Only Fudge's incompetence can be bothersome sometimes. You should have listened to me when I told you to run for the position of Minister of Magic. At that time, Fudge had the backing of Dumbledore, so it was not easy for me to win. If you had used the tactics I told you about, winning would have been an easy task. Well, soon enough, you will regret your decision. Did you predict something else again? Asked Amelia with a more serious look on her face. She knew that her nephew had some divination ability as he predicted Voldemort's downfall and even the death of a few people. In about four to five years, Voldemort should return, and shortly after that, the second wizarding war will take place, replied Edward with a calm look on his face. However, Amelia had stopped eating and had a serious look on her face. You do not need to worry about anything with me here. However, you should start taking power in the Ministry of Magic as a form of preparation. Amelia nodded before replying, well, with the magic potion you gave me and the tutoring you did for me, my magical ability has greatly improved beyond what I thought possible. So, it would be easier for me to train a few loyal people inside the ministry. Well, you can use the lesser magic potion that I gave you to entice people to your side. However, I should warn you to stay away from the people of the Order of Phoenix. You can become close to them, but do not try to add them to your inner circle. Boy, I know politics better than you, replied Amelia, despite intending to listen to her nephew's advice. She knew the reason for such a warning. The people of the Order of Phoenix were loyal to only one person, Albus Dumbledore. Your cousin Susan will be attending Hogwarts this year, so do take care of her if you can. Edward nodded, then the two of them continued to talk about different topics before separating. 13 The new base the next day after the dinner, Edward had a new idea, and that was to move his gate and laboratory to the moon to prevent possible trouble for himself. The Gate of World is an alchemy wonder and a powerful weapon that would draw the envy and desire of anyone who knew of its existence. So, it is best to place it somewhere inaccessible to anyone but Edward. The gate emitted powerful magical powers, and any truly powerful or experienced wizard can sense it if they are close to it. That is one of the reasons that Edward placed so many enchantments around it. 
not to mention the experiments that he conducts, the amount of muggle prisoners and dark wizards that he used in his experiments is quite large, so Edward is worried that someone might track these disappearances to him. Edward was never an arrogant person, so he never believed that all his precautions were enough to prevent such a thing. Furthermore, he never underestimated other wizards especially for aurors like mad -Eye Moody, who knows when a talented and experienced auror will trace all these missing people back to him. Or even worse, if the Ministry of Magic suddenly decided to raid his house just like they did with the Malfoys. So, after much deliberation, he decided to move his gate and his laboratory to a new base located on the moon. So, after taking his suitcase with the extension charm, he activated the gate of world and disappeared from the room, along with the gate itself. If there was a telescope looking at the moon, then astrologists would discover a massive silver gate appearing, then a young man holding a suitcase appearing from the gate. The first thing Edward did before transporting to the moon was placing a bubble head charm on his head, which provided him with oxygen to breathe. Then, he waved his hand to use a gravity charm personally created by Edward himself. He managed to do so after studying the gravity-resistant tree noted in the book Goss Hawk's Guide to Herbology. A wizard in Nepal had an in-depth study of this plant and Edward made a personal visit to him to discuss this plant. Another thing that inspired this spell was the enchantments that the Weasley twins used to make the anti-gravity hats jokes items in the canon timeline. So, after using the gravity charm to walk properly in the room, Edward used the incendio charm to heat his surroundings, then he headed to the dark side of the moon and used earth magic to dig a deep tunnel. One of Edward's major achievements since coming to this world was his understanding of elemental magic. To Edward, wizards are people that use fireball, ice spear, and earth spike. So, he spent a lot of time modifying spells like Incendio, Aguamnity, Defodio into elemental magic. Edward went as far as recreating many of the Jutsas from Naruto and a few elemental spells from DND from his previous life. According to Edward's current ability, his most powerful type of magic is the first elemental, then spatial magic due to his in-depth study of the Gate of World, and lastly, Transfiguration. However, the last one was not due to his effort, but a result of all his biological experiments. Throughout the years, he has dissected so many magical and non-magical animals that he can easily remember their anatomical structures with his perfect memory, then recreates them through transfiguration. After digging a cave deep underground somewhere on the moon and recovering it, Edward first placed an extension enchantment on the cave, then he transferred all the rooms in his suitcase into the cave. He placed a gravity enchantment in the cave and used any magical plants to create a living environment. Whether it was temperature, gravity, oxygen level, he recreated the living environment of Earth through magic. Then, he chose a room to place the Gate of World. After spending a few days placing countless protective enchantments around this base, Edward then continued his experiment. A few weeks then passed and he had to stop what he was doing because he received a message from his house elf Momo. In the past few weeks, he had managed to set up the experiment to observe the life code of magical creature fetuses. However, this process would take some time, so he focused on finding the specific substance of the werewolf bit that was capable of perfectly altering the life code of any individual. The reason he stopped his experiment was that he received news through a two-way mirror. The reason that she did not report directly to Edward was that this new base was hidden even from the house elf. The news that he received was that Hagrid took Harry Potter to Gringotts to acquire money. Edward was very interested in the Philosopher's Stone as he believed it would play a great role in his future. So, he must get it to study. And the perfect time to do so was when Hagrid first took it out from Gringotts. After operating back to Earth and to Diagon Alley, Edward placed a disillusionment charm on himself, he waited on a corner for Hagrid to leave the bank. Fortunately, he did not have to wait long as Hagrid soon came out of Gringotts looking very suspicious. Unfortunately for Edward, he soon discovered a few wizards disguised in normal clothes that were secretly following Hagrid. It was then he realized that Dumbledore must have backup plans for the stone, after all, even if he trusted Hagrid, the stone was too important to leave it to him alone. As such, Edward knew that it was impossible to acquire the stone now. However, he did not mind as he still had the opportunity back at Hogwarts. 14 Year 1, First Day September 1, 1991. Today was Edward's first day as a professor. After leaving his base on the moon, he changed into a new suit designed personally by Madame Malkin, took his suitcase, and operated in the dark forest. At first, Edward wanted to take the train to relieve his time in school and also see Harry Potter, but he gave up the idea as he lost interest and considered doing so a waste of time. After appearing in the dark forest, Edward floated in the air and flew in the direction of the castle. Edward can be a very arrogant person sometimes. Since he knew that Voldemort discovered a way to use magic to fly unsupported, he wanted to do it as well. And he succeeded. By combining the levitation charm with his gravity charm, he can use unsupported flight easily. After flying a few meters, he saw someone waiting for him on the ground, so he landed. Then, he saw a person the same size as a toddler standing there, it was Professor Phileas Flitwick. Professor Flitwick, it is good to see you. Edward my boy, it's been more than five years since I last laid eyes on you. Where have you been? After the greeting, Edward lowered himself to hug his favorite professor. Well, professor, I've been everywhere around the world. Now that we are colleagues, you can just call me Phileas. Now, tell me all about your adventures. I am sure that you have learned a lot of things. Edward nodded while discussing his travel with Phileas. 
At the same time, the two of them headed to the castle while talking. The relationship between Edward and Phileas is very close. For one, he was a Ravenclaw, so the professor was his head house during his time in school. Another reason was due to their study of the dark arts. Edward was a very talented wizard, so he was loved by all his teachers especially by his dean. One day, Edward went to Phileas and told him about the fact that he was going to study dark magic and needed his guidance. Phileas refused at first, but once Edward explained his views on how dark magic should not be fear, but studied with great precautions to understand it, Phileas hesitated. Of course, what changed his mind was the fact he knew that he could not change Edward's mind even if he refused to teach him, so, Phileas figured out it would be better for Edward to learn under his supervision. So, the two of them began to study the dark arts together. However, Phileas had many rules as conditions. For example, Edward has to use the patroness charm before every session to show that he was not corrupted by the dark arts. Additionally, they have to take two weeks to break every once in a while. And during that time, both of them were forbidden to use any form of dark magic. As a result of this partnership, the two of them co-wrote and published many papers in the category of defense against the dark arts. And it was all due to their in-depth understanding of dark magic. As a result of their papers, the two of them are very high-level members of the Dark Force Defense League and hold real power there. Of course, their partnership hit a little trouble when it was discovered by Dumbledore. However, Phileas defended Edward and they continued their study until he graduated. A few minutes later, Edward was led to the high table of the teachers in the Great Hall. After spending a few hours talking to the other teachers and reminiscing about his time in school, the other students entered the Great Hall. Following this, the first year entered. The Sorting Hat did his little song, and Edward was more than happy to sing along with it. Then, it was the turn of the sorting ceremony. First was Hannah Abbott, then it was Susan Bones, Edward's cousin. After the sorting hat was placed on top of Susan's head, it started talking to himself. Let me see. You are very magically talented, and it seemed that you were properly trained by a very powerful wizard. That person seemed to have instilled in you the love for knowledge and wisdom, so Ravenclaw is an option. Your desire to be acknowledged by that person as a great witch can also be considered a lofty ambition, so Slytherin is also possible. However, your magical abilities are acquired through hard work and dedication, so Hufflepuff. Meanwhile, at the high table, Edward waved to his cousin after she was assigned to her house. He secretly sighed as she seemed to follow the same path as the canon timeline. He thought with all the training he did for Susan when she was young that things might turn differently. Then, the sorting ceremony proceeded just like it did in the canon timeline. After Harry Potter was placed on Gryffindor, many people applauded out loud. Even Dumbledore who only symbolically applauded the other students started to applaud Potter out loud. Professor Babbling noticed that Edward was slowly clapping without a care, so she asked, Mr. Bones, you don't seem to be excited about Mr. Potter's arrival into the wizarding world. Are you perhaps worried that the savior will take your place as the most famous person in the wizarding world? 15 Savior Edward turned his head to see all the professors looking at him, then he gave Professor Babbling a speechless look. The two of them were very close, however, Professor Babbling is what some people in his past life referred to as a messy bitch. She just loves to create drama. However, Edward was used to this by now, so he just answered her. I have always found the idea that Harry Potter is the savior of the wizarding world very odd or off-putting. What is so odd about it? If it was not due to Mr. Potter, you know who would never be killed, thus ending the war, replied Professor Babbling with a frown on her face. Well, let me put it this way. When Potter supposedly killed Voldemort, he was nothing but a one-year-old infant that probably had not even had his magic right yet. So, there is no way that he was powerful enough to accomplish such a thing. Everyone knows that it was his mother who sacrificed herself, thus casting a powerful magic protection spell that protected Harry. Then, when you know who cast the killing curse on him, it backfired, killing him in the process, replied Hagrid, who was sitting not too far. Yes, you are correct, nodded Edward. But here lies the problem, why is it that Lily Potter is not considered the savior of the wizarding world? But instead, it is her son who probably could not even use a proper levitation curse yet is considered the savior. The high table of all the professors instantly became quiet. However, Edward was not finished talking. I have always been curious about what happened that night and have investigated it quite clearly. The only reason that Mr. Potter survived that night was that his mother used very ancient magic to protect him, the magic of love. You know, ancient magic is a truly wonderful thing. It is an intrinsic form of magic that is part of the universe, a fundamental part of reality. A dragon or troll's magic-resistant skin or scale is considered ancient magic as they are innate, and love is also a form of ancient magic. According to my research, no wizard can actively control ancient magic. Only by doing an act of pure selflessness, a pure act of sacrifice can some wizards use ancient magic. In the past few hundred years, only Lily Potter has managed to use this form of magic. Even the unspeakables in the department of mystery who has been studying the magic of love even before the Ministry of Magic was created could not use ancient magic. Yet, Lily Potter could. So, shouldn't such a witch be lauded and praised as the savior of the wizarding world? Shouldn't she be written in our history as her noble sacrifice was the true reason that peace was brought to the wizarding world? And, the thing about ancient magic is real as I discovered it on a website called Harry Potter Lexicon. Google it if you want to learn more. After a brief moment of silence, Professor Flitwick then asked, 
Then, why do you think that she was not chosen as the savior of the wizarding world? Edward looked at him. Isn't it obvious? No matter how amazing she was, it does not change the fact that she is Lily Evans, the muggle-born witch. The table once again became quiet. Meanwhile, Snape who was sitting at the end of the table secretly clutched his hand under his black robe. Nonsense, Professor Bones, suddenly said Professor McGonagall who had just finished with the sorting hat ceremony and who was secretly listening. The reason that Harry Potter became the savior was both because he is alive and because of the prophecy that foretold the downfall of he who must not be named by his hand, continued Professor McGonagall after taking her seat. Professor, in my experience, it is often easier to make the dead into martyrs. After all, they could not ask anything of the living. As for your arguments of the prophecy, how many people were truly aware of such a prophecy, let alone believe it? And even if what you say is correct, this should not stop Lily Evans from truly getting the recognition that she deserves? Frankly speaking, I do not think that one mere memorial statue of her in Godric's Hollow is enough to commemorate what she has done for the wizarding world. The table returned to a momentarily silence once again, however, this time, Dumbledore finally said something. Edward, I've always told you that the wizarding world is not as bad as you think. Lily was a very loved witch, and by many people too. As for the reason that she did not receive the recognition that she deserved, it has nothing to do with her origin from non-magical parents. After the war, most wizards just wanted some sort of spiritual substance, and thought that they could repay her sacrifice by elevating her son to the status of a hero, a savior to be praised and looked up to. Edward took a sip of his drink before answering calmly. One of the things that most wizards felt to understand is that there are different types of discrimination. One does not need to openly say that they hate or despise muggle-born wizards to be counted as discrimination. Some forms of discrimination are more subtle, systematic, and sometimes, a person might not even be aware that their actions might be perceived as such. A perfect example of that is Arthur Weasley. He loves muggles and has no problem with them. On the contrary, he loves them and finds their ways of life, technology, and cultures fascinating. And he would jump at the chance to ask them all sorts of questions given the opportunity. However, do you think that Arthur has even thought of the possibility that his actions were demeaning to muggles? That his overenthusiasm might be perceived as an insult? That his actions might make muggles feel like they are a rare piece of objects that is being studied? All the teachers had a pensive look on their faces. Most of them knew Arthur Weasley and knew that he would act exactly the way that Edward described him. The truth of the matter is the fact that all the wizards in the wizarding world accepted the fact that a Potter witch is a very ancient and renowned magical family as the savior instead of the muggle-born, first-generation magical family of Evans is itself a problem. Not to mention that none of you sitting here actually questioned the oddity of the situation until I brought it. Don't you think that this is a problem itself? This mode of thinking. All the professors were a little ashamed after hearing these words as Edward was right. They never had such thoughts, and just accepted Harry Potter as the savior. After noticing the embarrassments of the professors, Edward added, No need to be embarrassed as I am not any better than any of you. Although I am aware of the situation, I never tried to do anything about it. This sentence did make them feel better, so Professor Flitwick asked, So, why did you not do anything about it? Edward then answered with a calm face, Because I and the Bones family can greatly benefit from the rotten system of the wizarding world. Many people almost choked after hearing this, while the rest just sighed helplessly. Then, Headmaster Dumbledore stood up from his chair to say a few words to the students who were staring at the high table, confused about why they had to wait for so long. 16 Introduction I, all the professors noticed that the students had weird looks on their faces. To be precise, it was a look of shock and confusion. They instantly knew that something was wrong, so they looked around to figure out what happened. It turned out that Professor Babbling had secretly used the amplifying charm, Sonorous, during their conversation, so all the students overheard them. All the professors gave her a reprieving gaze, but she did not seem to mind. The reactions of many students were different. The Weasley twins just looked at each other before starting laughing. They agreed with how Edward described their father. Ron was mortified, so he lowered his head. As for Percy, he took out a quill and parchment and decided to write a letter to his mother and father talking about today's incident. Draco Malfoy was sneering after hearing the conversation. Although he did not like the idea of Potter's moodblood mother being the savior of the wizarding world, he was as happy that someone finally saw Harry Potter for who is, just an ordinary wizard, just like everybody else. He was no savior. As for Harry Potter himself, he was quiet, not because someone said that he did not deserve to be the savior. No, Harry never believed for a second that he was special. The reason that he became quiet was that he finally learned what happened to his parents the night he received the scar on his forehead. It turns out that his mother sacrificed her life to protect him. Maybe this professor is right. My mother is the one who deserves to be the savior, not me, he thought to himself. One of the people most affected by this conversation was the little witch Hermione Granger. As a clever person, she realized that the wizarding world is not just a mysterious and magical place full of wonder. It is a normal place, a normal civilized society and one full of discrimination at that. And in the future, she will have to struggle very hard to make a place for herself. She will have to work three times to four times harder to achieve the same result as a wizard from a pure blood or half-blood family. It was not just Hermione who came to this realization. Many of the muggle-born wizards in the Great Hall came to this realization. 
Many of them have been in the wizarding world for quite some time now and they have noticed some things. Before today, they convinced themselves that these things only happened at Hogwarts. And that, after graduation, when they go to the real world, things will be different, that their achievements will be based on their merits, not their background. However, after hearing the conversation between the professors, they realized that these problems are even more prominent in the wizarding world. After Dumbledore walked to the speaking podium in the shape of an owl, he started speaking to the students. Students, you do not need to worry about things that do not concern you. The world is not as negative as one would like to believe as many great people in it work tirelessly every day to make it a better place. Furthermore, every one of you can also make the wizarding world a better place, it all depends on the choices you make in the future. Now, a few announcements before we can start eating, I'm sure that each one of you is starving. Then, he went on to warn them about the room on the third floor, and that they were forbidden to use magic in the hallways or enter the dark forest. Then, he introduced Edward. Well, I would like to introduce your new alchemy teacher, Professor Edward Bones. Let him say a few words. Scene break. After Dumbledore introduced Edward, Hermione suddenly exclaimed, that's Edward Bones. You know him, asked Harry. Yes, he is a very famous wizard, maybe as famous as you. When he was young, he was head boy, prefect, winner of the Barnabas Finkley Prize for Exceptional Spell Casting, British Youth Representative to the Wizengamot, gold medal winner for groundbreaking contribution to the International Alchemical Conference in Cairo, Wizarding Schools Potions Championship, and he is the youngest person to receive the title of Grand Sorcerer and Alchemist Grand Master. He is one of my idols. And, all of these titles and rewards are real, except for the Alchemist Grand Master one which I made up. Additionally, according to my research, alchemy is the study of the four elements and the process of transforming metals into gold, and the search for a panacea, a remedy that would cure all maladies. For the sake of this fanfiction, let's decide that alchemy is all those things mentioned above and the study of how to make magical items like the joke items that the Weasley sold in their joke shop. Hermione, how do you know all these things? asked Harry Potter. That's because I have read a book about the most celebrated wizards of the 20th century. Both Dumbledore and Edward Bones were in it. Harry nodded his head, however, Ron Weasley who had his head lowered suddenly said, you should probably stay away from Edward's bones. Oh, why is that? asked Hermione, obviously displeased. I heard from my father that the Bones family advocates the use of black magic. They believe that dark magic is not something that should be feared, but studied it thoroughly to better understand how to defend against it. And many people in the ministry agree with them. Of course, Minister Fudge and Dumbledore strongly disagreed with them. What's wrong with Professor Edward's ideas? asked Harry Potter. Don't you know? replied Ron. Dark magic can turn a person crazy and evil. My father even said that the Bones family wanted to unite many wizards together to study the three unforgivable curses and create a counter curse for them. What are the three unforgivable curses? asked Harry back. This time, however, it was Hermione who answered. The three unforgivable curses are the three most cruel and sinister dark magic in the world. You know who used them a lot during the wizarding war, killing and torturing many people. According to what I know, the scar on your head is due to one of the unforgivable curses, and Harry, you are the only person in history to have ever survived from the unforgivable curse. Now you understand how dangerous it is to study this kind of dark magic, said Ron. You should not talk bad about Mr. Bones, he is a good person, suddenly said Neville Longbottom. The trio looked at him while wondering while he was defending the new professor. However, they did not ask as Edward had started to introduce himself. 17 Introduction 2. On the table of Hufflepuffs, as soon as Dumbledore finished introduced Edwards, someone immediately said, Susan, your surname is also Bones, are you related to this new professor? Susan nodded her head, yes, he is my cousin. In that case, you must know him very well. So, what kind of person is he? Well, I only have a few memories of him. However, I remember that he was very nice to me, always buying me toys and candy. However, he can be very strict sometimes when it comes to magic. The person who asked the question nodded along with the other students of Hufflepuffs. Meanwhile, Susan also took a trip down memory lane. She remembers many things about Edwards. She remembered that when she was four years old, her cousin fed her some kind of weird potion, then she had her first magic riot. Then, from then on, before bed, she would be placed in a special room in the house. After entering the room, she would stimulate many accidental magic bursts or magic power riots, as referred by her cousin, without her control, over and over again. At first she was confused why she had to do such a thing, however, later her aunt explained to her that this room was designed specifically for her by her cousin for her to create a magic power riot. An magic riot is when a young wizard accidentally uses his magical abilities due to uncontrollable emotions or when placed in danger, just like when Harry turned his aunt into a floating balloon. According to her aunt, Amelia, all wizards have a magic core inside the body that holds their magic powers. By constantly depleting her magic power every day and allowing it to replenish itself at a young age, it will make it easier for her to control her magic later on, by that time, magic will be like another limb to her, easily controlled and wielded. When Susan was six years old, her cousin graduated from Hogwarts and left to travel the world, so she rarely saw him from then on. Of course, she would receive letters and a gift every Christmas and every birthday. On her eighth birthday, she received a wand and a magical book personally created by Edward. 
The book contained a lot of his understanding of magic. However, it was hard for Susan to understand some of the things inside. Fortunately, this book was not an ordinary one. The book was an alchemy product enchanted with a powerful memory charm. When learning a specific spell from the book, she would enter Edward's memory and relieve all his understanding and experience of practicing said spells. Then, her aunt will supervise her to practice the spells for at least two hours a day, every day. And, similar to how Tom Riddle's diary could show his memory back at Hogwitz, but even more powerful. This lasted for three years until she reached the age to attend Hogwitz. As a result of such training, Susan has grown to love magic and practice hard every day even without her aunt's supervision. Susan did not know how special she was until she met a few people on the train. She learned from them that they did not know any magic, while she started to practice spells in the third grade already. Scene break. After Dumbledore introduced Edward, he walked in front of the students to say a few words. Some of you may already know me, as for the ones who do not, hello, I am Edward Bones, your future professor of alchemy. The first thing to know is the fact that since my class is an elective, only third grades and above can take it. And, according to my research, Hogwarts does offer alchemy classes, however, it is only when enough students are interested in the class, and it is only available to 6th and 7th graders. My class does not require you to take either the O.W.L's exams or the N.E.W.T. However, what I will teach you are real skills that can change your lives or even the entire wizarding world. Well, let me give all of you a brief demonstration. You over there, the young lady with the Ravenclaw pin. Come to the front. Edward was pointing at a young woman at the Ravenclaw table. She was at first surprised by the fact that she was called, however, she still followed his instruction and came to the front. What is your name? Peepinelope Clearwater. A beautiful name. Can I borrow your pin badge for a few seconds? She nodded her head before handing him the blue pin badge with an eagle on it. Edwards took it and gave a brief examination. Then, he held it in both his hands and started muttering long and weird incantations from his mouth. His hand glowed light green. A few minutes later, he gave her back the pin badge. Try it. Penelope was at first confused, but she still placed the badge on her uniform. Following this, she found herself floating in the air. At first, she was scared, then she soon got the hang of it. So, Penelope started to fly around the hallway like one of the ghosts. She flew over all the tables as she had a smile on her face, she would even yell out loud. Meanwhile, all the students and professors were looking at her with wonder. Many students wished that it was either them or their houses that were chosen. Of course the most surprised of these people was Dumbledore himself. As an alchemist, he knows what it takes to enchant a random object in a few minutes without a wand, and on the spot without any preparations, let alone enchanting them to be able to fly. He could not do such a thing, as a matter of fact, the only person he knows who can do such a thing is his old friend, Nicholas Flamel. After flying for five minutes, the enchantment on the badge seemed to have run out, so Edward waved his hand and Penelope landed on the ground without problem, then she returned to her seat. Despite having such an achievement in alchemy, Edward was not proud of his ability. He has seen the movie Thor in his past life. God King Odin was able to enchant a divine object like Mjolnir with a few words, and the enchantment was permanent. As for him, it took him a few minutes to enchant and it can only last five minutes. If his plans manage to work, he will eventually meet these legendary characters. So, Edward did not become too proud because of his little accomplishments. In this alternate universe, alchemy is the magic of creating artifacts like Gryffindor's sword or Ravenclaw's diadem. 18 Introduction, 2, all the students marveled at the scene that had just taken place. Then, they started clapping, it was a standing ovation. Meanwhile, there were different reactions about each grade. The first and second years became upset, while the other students were pondering whether to take Edward's class. The reason that some of them hesitate is that the alchemy class does not offer O.W.L.S. and N.E.W.T. exams. So, they feared that taking such an elective might make their grades suffer as they will have to spend a lot of time there. After the students calmed down, Edward said a few more words. Now, I have a few words for the Muggleborn students. I am sure that after spending a few years in the magical world, all of you should have noticed the lack of entertainment. After all, the three most current fun activities of wizards include Quidditch, Wizard Chess, and Yu-Gi-Oh! Dueling Cards which was invented by yours truly. However, what people do not know was that Yu-Gi-Oh! was inspired by a Muggle comic I read once when I was a child. Many people were surprised by this revelation, so they paid more attention when they realized that Edward might say something important. Of course, Edward lied. He did not know whether there was a Yu-Gi-Oh! manga in this world. And even if there was, it was probably not created yet when he invented it in the wizarding world. I am sure that all of you, at some time, wished that the magical world had things like television, movies, filming cameras, video games, Walkman, or CD players. All types of things that you get to enjoy when you return home. So, if any of you take my class, I will endow you with the necessary knowledge and skills to invent the magical versions of these items. And things do not have to stop there. Whether it is some random ideas you saw in a comic or fictional novel, you can try to invent them through alchemy. Who knows, maybe the next grand alchemist that revolutionized the wizarding world is one of you. After Edward finished his speech, people started to applaud again. This time, it was the Muggleborn students that first began the applause, then other people followed. However, the Slytherin table was not that enthusiastic about Edward's words. 
Nevertheless, they still showed some sign of respect. The reason? Because their parents warned them to try to get the favor of Edward Bones. Due to his talents, many pure blood families believe that Edward will be the next Dumbledore. Or better yet, the next Dark Lord. So, they planned to get on his good side as soon as possible. After Edward finished his introduction, he returned to his table. When he passed by Dumbledore, the latter whispered with the utmost gratitude, Thank you, Edward. To which, the former just nodded. Edward knew the reason that the headmaster thanked him so sincerely. It was because of his speech directed towards the Muggleborn wizards. Professor Babbling's little stunt has greatly damaged these Muggleborn students' courage and confidence towards the future. After all, they had just learned that their efforts might amount to nothing in the wizarding world due to bloodline discrimination. However, Edward's encouragement that they could be the next grand alchemist further motivated as he pointed out the advantages that they have over pure blood or half blood wizards. After Edward took his seat, he saw Professor Quirrell secretly looking at him. He could see that he was having trouble keeping the facade of a stuttering buffoon. And Edward guessed that it was probably Voldemort that was not happy with either his rant about Lily Evans, or his encouragement of the Muggleborn wizards. Or better yet, Voldy might be a little afraid of his talent, scared that he will reach a level of strength matching his. That would place a big hindrance in his plans after he managed to come back. However, Edward did not care about him. In his current state, Voldemort is not a match for him, and he is confident that by the time he is resurrected, he will be way more powerful than him. And that is only if he allows him to resurrect. Scene break. Hermione and Harry were excited after hearing Edward's speech as they were more than familiar with all the things he listed. However, it was the first time that they have heard that the magical world did not have all these things. Do you know any of these things that professors talked about? What exactly is a CD player? It is something to listen to music, replied Harry while shoving a piece of chicken in his mouth. He has been starving ever since the train ride, but now he could finally eat something. While the trio was eating and discussing, a ghost suddenly walked through their tables, almost scaring a few people. That's Headless Nick, said one student. I heard from a seventh year that Headless Nick used to be nearly Headless Nick. How can someone who used to be nearly headless become headless, asked Seamus Finnegan. Well, let me explain, suddenly said, Headless Nick. My neck used to be almost cut off. Then, he showed the students how his head used to be, with only a little skin attached. Now, it can be completely removed, he then proceeded to completely remove his head. How is that possible? No magic can permanently damage a ghost as they are already dead, said Ron Weasley. That may have been true previously, said Nick, who was holding his head in his hand. But when Professor Bones was in his school, he invented a spell that permanently hurt ghosts, and he used it to make me completely headless. Now, I am a proud member of the Headless Hunt. Headless Nick was correct. When Edward was in school, he began to study the soul, and that eventually led to him studying ghosts. He promised nearly Headless Nick that if he allowed him to study him, he would help become completely headless. And Edward fulfilled his end of the bargain after finishing all the experiments he needed to do. The dinner lasted a few hours before everyone left for their destination. Edward was escorted by Phileas to his own professor quarter. After entering, he took a note from his coat that read, See me in the dark forest tonight. You owed me an explanation. Severus Snape. 19 contract later that night, Edwards left his room and headed to the Forbidden Forest. After arriving there, he saw a magical mark guiding him somewhere, so he followed it until he discovered Snape waiting for him. He still had that same expressionless look on his face, while wearing a dark cloak making him look like a bat. Edward Bones, it's been more than five years, and you have yet to show me the final proof. What are you worried about? Didn't I already show you that my words were true, replied Edward with a rather calm look on his face. Yes, but we are still missing the final piece of the puzzle. Do not forget that you are also under a magical contract. Fine, I'll show it to you. Then, with a wave in his hand, Edward and Snape disappeared from the Forbidden Forest. Scene break. When Edward was in his sixth year, he had an interesting conversation with Snape in his office. At that time, Severus had only been teaching at Hogwarts for a few years. After entering his office, Edward handed him a piece of paper. It was a magical contract. After reading the contract, Snape sneered before saying, Are you fooling with me, Mr. Bones? According to the contract, once Snape signed it, Edward would have access to all his magical knowledge including both charms and potions. All the spells and potions created or improved by Snape would belong to him. Snape would never accept such a thing. Edward was not mad at the professor's words. He knew that Severus Snape was a very talented individual. And as such, he must have his pride and dignity. Professor, there is no need to be angry. Just wait until you hear what I have to say. Go on Mr. Bone. However, I hope that you will not waste both of our time, replied Snape with a cold look on his face. After organizing his words for a few seconds, Edward then elaborated. When my parents died, I became fascinated with death. I started to wonder whether there was any kind of magic that could bring death back to life. Unfortunately, there was none. Or at least, none I could use. So, I decided to create one of my own. I have studied the concept of death for many years and I have discovered something fascinating. Death can be divided into two aspects, the body and the soul. Once either of those two things has a problem, then people, or animals die. After further investigation, I realized that the majority of deaths are due to the body as there is very little magic that can affect the soul. 
Well, to be precise, the soul is one of the few nearly immortal things. Even the killing curse does not affect the soul. After this discovery, I started to wonder if I could recreate the body of my parents, then place their souls back into their bodies, maybe I can bring them back. Snape's breathing became rapid for a few seconds before he managed to calm himself down. That is preposterous. Even a grand alchemist like yourself should be aware that it is impossible to recreate a perfect body, let alone the issues regarding the soul. Edward nodded his head. You are correct. Even with all my knowledge of alchemy, I cannot do such a thing, yet. However, the science and technology of muggles can do such a thing. Through DNA cloning, they can perfectly rebuild a human body. Of course when I visited the muggle world, this technology was years from being perfected. However, after I controlled some of the smartest of them and forced them to work together, the speed of the process has greatly reduced. And, the first cloned sheep was created in 1996, while the first human was in 2002. However, there is no proof that a real human clone was created in 2002. Severus took a deep look into Edward's eyes. Unfortunately for him, the other party's acclumency was even more profound than him. Even if what you say is the truth, what about the issue of the soul? Edward smiled before continuing. Professor, it is quite easy to determine whether I am telling the truth. All you have to do is visit the muggle company that I am in control of. As for the issue of the soul, well, I also investigate this aspect as well. And the answer I came up with was one of the Deathly Hallows, the Resurrection Stone. With it, I could summon the souls of my parents from the clutches of death itself and bring them back to life in their new bodies. Your story is still absurd, Mr. Bones, replied Snape. Any wizards can tell you that the Deathly Hallows are nothing but a tale told to children right before bed. You are wrong, Professor. The Hallows are real and I know the location of all three. Two of them the Elder Wand and the Cloak of Invisibility are in the hands of Headmaster Dumbledore. As for the last one, well, because it is currently protected by a very powerful dark magic, I could not take it. However, it is only a matter of time before it becomes mine. Snape took a deep breath before saying, Your story is interesting and all, Mr. Bones, but what does it have to do with me? Oh, Professor, there is no need to feign ignorance. I know a lot of things that I should not know. For example, your rivalry with James Potter and his group, the fact that the invisible cloak used to belong to James himself before he entrusted it for Dumbledore after his death. More importantly, I know of your love for a certain green-eyed little witch. So, I am confident that you are fully aware of what I am implying. Snape stares at Edward while secretly holding his wand, pondering whether to take drastic actions. However, he did not do so. That night, he operat to a secret company in the muggle world. After checking that Edward was telling the truth, he signed the contract the very next day. Scene break. Back to the present time, Edward operat him and Snape to the Gaunt's family shack, where the resurrection stone was located. After spending more than a half hour to temporarily disable all the protection that Voldemort placed on the house, he retrieved the ring. As soon as Snape saw the ring, he recognized the stone on top of it. He has spent the past seven years researching every single detail about the stone. With a look of yearning, he reached out to take it. Fortunately for him, Edward caught his hand before he managed to touch it. Do you want to die? Forgive me, replied Snape. I simply could not resist myself. Well, you would not be the only one. After that, the two of them left the shack and Edward reactivated all the previous protection. Outside of the shack, Edwards looked deeply into Snape's eyes before saying, Severus, you are not to tell anyone about this. I know how to keep a secret. Severus, you seem to not understand, replied Edward with a deep bloodlust in his eyes. I have my plans for this ring, and if you were to ruin them by opening your mouth, then I can guarantee you a one-way voyage to meet your lovely Lily. Do you understand me? Severus' heart skipped a beat as he took a half-step back. The only time has seen such powerful bloodlust was in the eyes of his former master. So, he knew that Edward was not joking when he said these words. I will swear an unbreakable oath that I will not reveal anything. That's good. That night, Edward returned to the castle after Snape swore the oath. However, while walking back to his room, he felt someone shadowing him. I know you are here, so you might as well show up. Twenty encounter after Edward said these words, a white and illusory shadow showed up in front of him. At first, it was in the shape of a white ball, then it turned into a figure, to be exact, it was a beautiful woman floating a few inches from the ground. This woman had waist-length hair, with a scholarly, intellectual, or cultured air about her. As a result of this, she can appear to be prideful. However, her beauty more than made up for this flaw. Helena, how have you been? Asked Edward with a smile on his face, showing his joy at seeing her. I would have been better if you did not abandon me for more than five years replied the ghost of Helena Ravenclaw with a calm look on her face. Before I left, I specifically warned you that this would happen, so you cannot blame me for this. So, you're telling me that with your ability, you could not just apparate to see me. You know that it is impossible to apparate directly in Hogwarts. So, you could not apparate in the Forbidden Forest, then sneak in to see me, or better yet, just make your house elf apparate you. Edward smiled stiffly after hearing this, while also appearing a little embarrassed. Let's not talk about the past. What matters now is that I am back and we can spend all the time together while I am a professor. Then, Edward took out his wand and pointed at her. Corporeal body, chanted Edward. Following this, Helena's transparent ghost body slowly turned into flesh and blood. 
from her skin, all the way to her hair, and even her 10th century clothes turned real. After that, Edward embraced her in his arms, then gently kissed her in her soft and red lips, turning their conversations into a deep and passionate kiss. There is no need to focus too much on the past. Now that I am here, we can make up for all the time we missed. Humph, you are lucky that I found you very charming, otherwise, this would not be the end of things, replied Helena with a soothing voice and a blush on her face. Then the two of them started kissing like they were two lovers separated for countless years, and yet the passion remains between them. However, midway through their snogging session, they heard the sounds of footsteps approaching, so they separated, reluctantly. Edward could guess that it was Filch doing a night tour to ensure that no students were up past the curfews, but he was not happy despite knowing that this caretaker was doing his job. So, he took out his wand, and with a wave of it, he placed a disillusionment charm on the two of them. Then, Edward floated in the air while still embracing Helena, then he flew to his own professor lounge in the castle. That night, he and Helena spent a wonderful evening together. The two of them expressed their emotions through pure physical actions. You would think that Helena who was a witch born and lived in the 10th century would be quite reserved when it comes to physical intimacy. Unfortunately, she has been slowly corrupted by Edward over the years. In some ways, she was more enthusiastic than him. The next day, Edward woke up early. However, he did not find Helena sleeping next to her after checking. It seemed that the power of the corporeal body charm I placed on her ran out early. Hmm, I should probably do something about the duration. However, she did not have to leave without mentioning something to me. Is this her way of saying that she is still mad about the past five years, thought Edward secretly. After that, he took a shower and went to the great hall to grab something to eat. His first class did not begin until a few days later. However, midway through, he saw one of the first year looking around, he seemed to be waiting or searching for somebody. As soon as Edward approached, the person seemed to lit up and rushed towards him with great excitement. Mr. Longbottom, what can I do for you? Professor, I would like to give you these. Then he proceeded to hand Edward two packages. My grandmother sent you the first one, while I saved enough money for the second present. This is to thank you for all you have done for my parents. We know that this is probably not enough, but this is the best we can do to express our gratitude. Edward looked at the two gifts, one was a book, while the other was a bag of candy. Thank you, Mr. Longbottom. Furthermore, the price of a gift does not matter, only the intention behind it. After that, Neville thanked him again before leaving. However, midway through, he met with Harry, Ron, and Hermione who overheard his conversation. So, they asked him about it, and Neville replied without hesitation. After the death of you-know-who, my parents were tortured through the Cruciatus curse by Bellatrix Lestrange, resulting in them losing their minds. At one point, they could not even recognize me. However, Professor Bones created healing magic that cured them. Although they have not completely recovered, now they can recognize me and my grandmother, and can even function normally. The only problem is that they could not use magic yet. However, according to Professor Bones' treatment, they should be fine in a few years. The trio was surprised, not just because of Edward's accomplishment, but the fact that Neville's parents were through so much suffering and pain. As for Edward, he went to eat his breakfast. However, during the whole process, he was thinking about Neville's parents. One time in school, he started a study on the relationship between the mind, body, memories, and soul. According to science, memories should be located in the brain. However, as a transmigrator, he retained all the memories from his past life, meaning that memories are also related to the soul. Additionally, he also wondered about the correlation between the mind, soul, and memories. After months of research, he realized that the perfect subject for his experiments were the patients at the St. Mungo Hospital especially the ones whose minds became damaged through magic. These patients often have trouble with both their minds or thinking and with their memories. So, Edward used his family connection to spend an internship at St. Mungo's Hospital to study these patients. He went as far as paying a visit to Gilderoy Lockhart and learned about memory charm, Obliviate, from him. And his research was a great success. He found the correlation between the mind, body, memories, and soul. To repay these people for being his experimental subject even though it was not voluntary he created much healing magic to help them and their families. While Edward was eating, he received a voice transmission from Severus Snape. This was one of the magic that he also created after modifying the sonorous charm. It was very useful for secret conversations. Last night, I forgot to tell you that there were some problems with the DNA clones that your muggle company created. Is that so? Then, let's visit there later and I will check it out. As you wish. 21 clone problems after having his breakfast, Edward went on to prepare for the first day of class. Since he was so engrossed with his research most of the summer, he was quite behind in his preparations. After making sure that all the materials needed for his alchemy class were prepared, he then focused on the books for the class. Lucky for him, he had already written the textbook, just needed to print the book itself. Afterward, Edward went to meet with deputy headmistress Minerva McGonagall. She handed him a list of all the students that have already signed up for his class. This list was quite extensive. Although Edward guessed that his class would be popular based on the stunt that he did yesterday, he did not think that it would be this popular. Moreover, a lot of the people who signed up are muggle-born wizards. It seemed that yesterday's speech did have quite an impact on them. It seems that I have to print out more books and get more materials. 
Luckily, I am not the one paying for all the resources that will be wasted in all the trial and errors these students will go through, muttered Edward to himself after seeing the long list. Unfortunately for him, Professor McGonagall overheard him and gave him a strict stare. Edward was then a little embarrassed as Minerva, as the deputy headmistress, will be the one worrying about the finances of the school. As for Dumbledore himself, he seemed to leave everything in the control of McGonagall unless something happens that she judged she could not decide or take the responsibility for. Well, if it was up to Edward, she would be the headmistress of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and it is not just because she is already in charge of the entire school. After handling all the things required for his class, Edward went for a slight tour of the castle. After being gone for five years, he still missed many parts of it. Afterward, he went to visit Hagrid. Back in school, Edward and Hagrid have been very close friends. At first, he approached him to get access to all the resources of the Forbidden Forest. But soon enough, he became quite close with the half-giant due to his gentle and naive nature. Their friendship reached a peak after he taught Hagrid his invented spell, Nature Voice, which allowed him to communicate with magical animals. For Hagrid who loves magical animals more than anything else this spell was more precious than any amount of galleons. By the time Edward finished talking with Hagrid, it was already nighttime. So, he went to the Forbidden Forest at the same spot that he met Snape last night. Then, the two of them operat to a very secret building in the Muggle world. The room was full of scientists of different ages, gender, and ethnicity. At first, these people were surprised by Edward and Snape's sudden appearance. Then they soon calmed down as they are used to these people's mode of suddenly appearing. Then, many of them saluted Edward. This was both because he was the boss behind this operation, and also because of his vast knowledge. The majority of these scientists are some of the smartest people in the world, so they have their pride. Even if Edward forced them to work together, it did not mean that they would respect him. However, all of this changed when they realized that Edward was as if not more knowledgeable than them especially in the field of anatomy and biology. As a person who aspires to travel across countless universes and dimensions, Edward knew the importance of science. So, with his perfect memory and high IQ, he studied many fields. Not to mention that sometimes, looking at things from a scientific point of view can help his magic research. Adding to that, many of the spells he created are either based on scientific principles or inspired by scientific ideas. After arriving in this secret research lab, Edward was escorted to a specific room. There were three people naked and floating in a very large glass tube with green liquids in it. Of these three people, two were women and one was a man. The first two people were Edward's parents, Edgar Bones and his wife, Johanna Bones. And, I could not find the name of Edgar's wife, so I chose a name for her. As for the last woman, of course, it was Harry Potter's mother, Lily Potter. To be precise, they were clones of them. After looking at the common peaceful look on these clones, Edward asked the chief scientist in charge of this particular project. What is the problem with them? According to our findings, none of these clones can live for more than a year before dying, replied a white-haired old man. Is it due to gene collapse? Asked Edward with a frown on his face. Yes, sir. Edward nodded with a pensive look on his face. Snape approached him with his usual somber look, do you have a solution? 22 more questions than answers after a few seconds of thinking, he replied, why don't you fix the problems yourself? However, Snape just looked at him plainly before answering, there is no need to mock me. If I could solve the problem myself, I would not have asked you. Why can't you solve the problem yourselves? Continued Edward. Isn't it obvious, Mr. Bones? I do not understand any of these muggles so-called science and technology. Why don't you solve the problem using magic? Asked Edward back while looking directly into Snape's eyes. What do you mean? Asked Severus with a confused look on his face. If you have something to say, please be blunt. You are an excellent potion master, have you thought about using magic potions to solve the problem? Snape had a pensive look on his face for more than half a minute before he asked, how would I go about doing that? Simple, replied Edward with a smile on his face. Since we know that the problem lies with the clone's DNA, what you have to do is invent a potion that stabilizes the DNA. You can acquire a bunch of magical herbs or plants, then have muggle prisoners eat them and observe the different effects on their bodies especially the DNA. Then, with your expertise as a potion master, it should be quite easy for you to create a potion that can stabilize the clone's DNA after a few trial and errors. Severus Snape took a few seconds before calmly nodding in acknowledgement of the idea. However, despite his serious face, Edward swore that he saw sparkles in Snape's eyes after hearing his idea. Or maybe, it was just in his head. After this brief conversation, Severus left to prepare for the potion. Meanwhile, Edward was thinking of something completely different. He walked to one of the clones and took out his wand, Rosero Codexida. Then, the life code of these clones appeared in front of him. This spell was the result of his research in the last month during vacation. It allowed him to access the life code of any human, wizard, or animal without any machines or applying countless ocular spells on himself. And, as you can imagine, this is not a canon spell, but one created for this fiction. I thought that I would use Latin to make the story more authentic, but you guys can tell me whether to continue doing so or just use English words like in the previous chapters. As expected, the body section of these people's life code was as unstable as their DNA. However, Edward was not paying attention to this. 
What he was wondering about was the fact none of the clones had a magic core and magic powers, so technically speaking, they were muggles. After their souls are placed back on their bodies, would something change or would they remain the same? According to Edward's understanding, Bloodline was responsible for granting wizards magic powers, and none of these clones had any bloodline according to their life codes. Additionally, a person's soul is connected to their bloodlines? So, would they regain their magical connections after their soul returned to their bodies? After all, souls have been seen to perform magic. A perfect example of that was when the souls of Harry Potter's parents and Cedric Diggory managed to use magic for a brief moment when Voldemort tried to kill Harry Potter in the grave after his resurrection. Another example is the fact that Voldemort was able to use some sort of magic to possess Quirrell's body while he was still in the shape of a soul. If it is proven that the soul can indeed use magic, Edward then wondered whether a muggle would acquire magical powers after the soul of a wizard occupied his body? Although Edward has deep research in the soul, he never actually thought of these questions until now. Unfortunately, for him, it will take quite a while before he finds the answers to the questions. His study of the life code has just begun and he has many things to learn. After dealing with the problems at the cloning research lab Edward returned to the castle. He first tried to find Helena, however, he did not see her as she seemed to be avoiding him. Then, he took the opportunity to read the book that Neville gifted him this morning. This was a book about herbology. After reading it, Edward discovered that this was a very old book and a very precious one too. He guessed that it might be one of the family heirlooms of the Longbottom family. This book includes the names of some very old and extinct magical herbs and plants, and their functions. It even describes other herbs that can be used as replacements for the extinct one, and more importantly, possible theories on how to recultivate these lost herbs. In general, this book was quite informative to Edward. However, he was quite surprised that he did not have this book in his collection. During his days as a thief, he also visited the Longbottom family. Of course, due to their relationship, he did not steal anything and chose to copy all their books. Surprisingly though, he did not have this book. It was then that Edward realized that maybe these families may have kept their most precious things somewhere else possibly in Gringotts. Maybe I should pay a visit to Gringotts one of these days, secretly thought Edward to himself. Then, he fell asleep after reading the book. He wanted to go to bed early as tomorrow was his first day as a professor. 23 first day of class the next day, Edward got ready and went to his first class. He was teaching third year first, while he had another class in the afternoon and the rest of them were scattered throughout the week. After entering the class, Edward saw all his students were already there waiting for him. Good morning, class. Good morning, professor, replied all the students in the class in unison. Edward then took out his wand, and with a wave of it, the pile of books on his desk floated from their places and each student had one book flying to them. The books were called, Introduction to Alchemy, written by Edward Bones. After each student had a book of their own, Edward started to introduce the study of alchemy. Alchemy is composed of two categories, the first one is the study of the four elements and their composition, the study of the transmutation of metals into gold, and the search of a panacea rumor to be able to cure any malady. The second category is the study of the invention of magic items. This class will only focus on the second category as only some of the most powerful alchemists can study the first category, not to mention the number of resources needed to do so. Professor, can you turn metals into gold? After all, you are a grand alchemist, suddenly asked one student, who did not raise his hand. Edward looked over at the person who asked the question and saw that it was two of them. You guys must be the Weasley twins. Have you heard of us? Asked both Fred and George at the same time. Of course, replied Edward. Professor McGonagall did warn me about you two's antics. Additionally, I knew your brother Bill when I was in school. Although I was two years older than him, we often talked and he mentioned some of the things you guys have done back home. Fred, it seems that our legendary escapades are known far and wide, proclaimed one of the twins while looking at the other. That's true, George. Even the famous Edward Bones knows about them. Okay, you two need to calm down so that I can continue with the class. But professor, you have not answered the question, said another student. But this time, it was one from Ravenclaw. I will answer the question, however, from now on, if anyone has a question or wishes to say something, please raise your hand first. All the students quieted down and began to listen. After organizing his words, Edward continued. Yes, I have managed to turn all kinds of metals into gold. Unfortunately, this change has never been permanent. It can only last for up to six months. According to my knowledge, there is only one alchemist alive that is capable of doing a permanent change of matter. Yes, Mr. Davies, any question? Is that alchemist Professor Dumbledore? Asked Roger Davies from Ravenclaw. No, it is not the headmaster. And if any of you are curious, go find the answer in the library. Now, let us get back to class. To make any magic items, you first need to understand all the different materials and how conductive they are, and how to process them. However, this aspect of alchemy is pure memorization, and we will deal with the procession another day. Today, I will guide you to the creation of your first alchemical item. With a wave of Edward's hand, two things appeared in front of each student. One of them was a circular plate, while the other resembled a quill-like object. Who among you knows the protego charm? Raise your hand. Only three people in the entire class raised their hands, the Weasley twins and Cedric Diggory. 
I completely forgot that under Minister Fudge's rule, the education at Hogwarts has been quite subpar recently. Well, you guys should know the levitation charms, right? If I remember correctly, that is the first spell that you learn in the first year. All the students nodded their heads. Okay, what I need all of you to do is to take your enchanting quills, and write the incantations for the levitation charm Wingardium Leviosa on the circular piece of metal. Remember, when you are writing these words, do not forget to remember the feeling you have when you use the spell. After saying these words, Edward did a demonstration to the students, he engraved the word Wingardium Leviosa on the metal. Following this, the metal plate started to levitate on its own. The students became excited and decided to give it a try. Unfortunately, they soon realized that things were more difficult than they imagined. For once, the enchanting quill did not always write the words that they wanted it to. They had to concentrate deeply before it could function properly. Secondly, if the magic power was interrupted during the process of writing, then all the previously written words would be wiped away. Not to mention that the students have to deal with certain resistance from the metal plate itself. As such, Edward walked around the classroom, giving pointers and pointing out the mistakes the students made. However, despite the many failures, they seemed to be having fun. By the end of class, many of the students managed to finish their engravings, thus making their metals plate levitate from the ground. Of course, the majority of them only levitated a few centimeters, while the best of them could only levitate a few inches. After class, Edward did not give them parchment papers for homework, but gave them the metal plate and enchanting quill and asked them to practice on their own. Furthermore, he also asked them to learn the protego charm as this would be their next practice. 24 plans for the future after finishing his evening class, Edward finally had some free time for his own. So, he headed to the restricted area of the library to read, as this was one of the main reasons that he came back to Hogwarts. On his way there, he started thinking about his plans. According to Edward, he planned to use his knowledge of the future to his benefit, and as such, he needs to interfere with the plot as little as possible. And if he does intervene, then, he must ensure that things proceed similarly, with only a few minor details changed. This is one of the reasons that he forbade Snape from taking the Resurrection Stone or telling anyone about it. According to the canon timeline, this stone was one of the main reasons that led to Dumbledore's death, and Edward is not about to change that. Personally, Edward has no real problem with Dumbledore. On the contrary, he admires him greatly. He admires the fact that Dumbledore always refuses to use his power to his advantage. In the canon timeline, he let people like Fudge and Rita Skeeter walk all over him and his legacy, yet he did nothing to defend himself. As one of the most powerful wizards of modern time, he did not have to let his dignity being trampled on like this, and yet, it still happened. Edward himself knew that he could never be like Dumbledore. A perfect example of this was the fact that after his rise, Rita Skeeter once wrote an article about him insinuating that he was a dark wizard that killed women and children. The next day after this article was released, Edward visited her and instilled the fear of Merlin into her. That same day, that article was removed and she issued a personal apology in the Daily Prophet for lying and writing fake news about Edward to draw more attention. Many people guessed that there was something shady behind Rita's sudden change of attitude, but there was no evidence and Rita herself refused to say anything more about the entire situation. Edward is very grateful for Dumbledore as the headmaster can be considered his teacher. After Dumbledore discovered that Edward was studying dark magic and that he could not stop him, he tried to divert his attention to something else. As such, he would secretly give him a bunch of precious books about alchemy. Some of them were even Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel's notes containing their understandings, ideas, and experiments. One of the reasons that Edward was able to become a grand alchemist so quickly was due a lot to Dumbledore. Unfortunately, the headmaster underestimated Edward's learning ability, so not only did he learn all the alchemy knowledge he received, he still made rapid progress in his study of the dark arts. Despite the teacher-student relationship that he has with Dumbledore, Edward still has no plans to save the headmaster. Edward can foresee that it is only a matter of time before he becomes the most powerful wizard of this world. By then, he did not want someone else to challenge his power or decision at every turn. As such, Dumbledore must die. As for Edward, even if he believed that most of the wizards in the wizarding world are not worth anything when combined, they are still a powerful force to reckon with. And maybe, in his future travel throughout dimensions, he might need their help. Not to mention that he might still need to recruit some talented people even if the number is small in scale. Throughout the seven years, Harry Potter is in school, many interesting things happen and many rare things of the wizarding world suddenly appear, rare objects that Edward desires. For example, the Philosopher's Stone, the Basilisk, the Goblet of Fire, and so on. Not to mention that Edward planned to use certain situations to his advantage and acquire other forms of benefits. Especially the events that occur in Harry Potter's fifth year. Edward has grand plans for it as he believes that this might be the final thing he needs to finish his gate of world, so he cannot wait. At the same time, he must ensure that the general outline of the plot also remains the same. After thinking about all these things, a happy mood enveloped Edward as he headed to the library for a long session of reading. 25 Halloween just like that, a few months passed by, and it was already Halloween time. After checking, Edward realized that most of the plots proceeded the same way without him. Whether it was Harry Potter joining the Quidditch team after Neville had an accident in class, the midnight duel with Draco that led to Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Neville finally meeting Hagrid's Fluffy. 
As today was Halloween, Edward knew that the troll incident would occur. At first, he did not plan to intervene, but he suddenly changed his mind. Edward realized that with her intelligence and wit, Hermione was the perfect person to be part of his future elite team of powerful and talented witches and wizards that he planned to create. So, he decided to make a great first impression on her. So, during the Great Hall dinner, Edward took out his version of the Marauder's map and tracked all the people in the castle. He saw Hermione in the girls' bathroom, and he also saw when Coral released the troll. Using the excuses that he had to go to the restroom, Edward left the Great Hall and headed for the girls' bathroom. And he only showed up when the troll finally discovered Hermione. Edward watched as the troll raised his club and was about to hit her, he waved his wand and a shield charm appeared around her, also deflecting the troll's massive club. Professor Bones, said Hermione with a look of relief on her face as she watched Edward slowly approach her while simultaneously ignoring the troll. It is very dangerous to be out there alone, Ms. Granger, replied Edward calmly. I'm sorry, she replied while lowering her head. It's fine as long as you are okay. Then, Edward looked at the troll that was trying to destroy his shield, with no success whatsoever. Interesting magical creatures, suddenly said, Edward. Who? Trolls? Asked Hermione with a puzzled look on her face. Yes. Many people think that they are stupid magical beasts with very low levels of intelligence. However, most people fail to see the value in them. Do you know that a troll's skin is very magic resistant? Also, this part of its body is part of ancient magic. Ancient magic? Is that the same one you mentioned that Harry's mother used to save his life from you know who? Yes, nodded Edward. Imagine if wizards could thoroughly understand this kind of magic and replicate it? Imagine having the magic resistance of both dragons and trolls, with the strength of giants? That would truly be a fascinating thing, wouldn't it? But professor, didn't you say that ancient magic could not be wielded by wizards? That only act of pure self-sacrifice can allow a witch or wizard to use it, asked Hermione. You are partially correct. I do not think a wizard can wield the power of love like Harry's mother did. However, replicating the innate abilities of magical animals like trolls and dragons is still possible, just need the right method. Not to mention that even if ancient magic is impossible to wield, it doesn't mean that we should not study it. I believe that magic is like science, meaning there are underlying principles that govern them. And our jobs as wizards is to study and discover these principles. After saying this, Edward then looked at the pondering Hermione and he secretly nodded. He came here not only to give her a first good impression but also to spread some of his ideas to her. Now that he was done, he decided to finish this troll off. With a wave of his wand, the club of the troll transfigured into long chains that bound the troll until he fell on the ground, squirming and trying to free himself. Then, Edward walked next to his ears and pointed his wand. A powerful scream ringed on the troll's head, rupturing his eardrum, then he passed out. The odd thing was that this sound did not travel out loud but only stayed in the vicinity of Edward and Hermione. The spell that Edward used by one he modifies the sonorous charm into a specific sound wave attack to either kill or incapacitate his enemies depending on the intensity that he chooses. Soon after Edward dealt with the troll, he saw Harry and Ron rushing to the girls' bathroom. It seems that you have some true friends willing to go through danger to save you, Miss Granger. That is an enviable thing. It seems so. A few seconds later, Harry and Ron rushed inside and saw the troll on the ground. However, they were more occupied by her safety. After making sure she was alright did they notice Edward and the passed out troll. Soon after, the other teachers came, and things proceeded similarly in the book with Hermione admitting that she went after the troll. Of course, she also acknowledged the fact that it was Edward who saved her life. Then, everybody proceeded to go their ways.